We are live. Okay. And still five. Okay, just turned six o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and start the meeting. Um, opening of the meeting, uh, call to order, and I will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I didn't ask anyone in advance. So uh, Rebecca, I'm looking right at you. Do you want to lead us in the pledge? Sure. Okay, thank you. Everybody, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. All right, thank you, everybody. Okay, invocation, we have none. So city clerk's report on posting the agenda and roll call. Tonight's meeting agenda was posted on Wednesday, June 16 at 2.09 p.m. Council Member Armandaris? Present. Council Member Bracco? Here. Council Member Hilton? Here. Council Member Lero Munoz? Present. Council Member Marks? Here. Council Member Tovar? Here. And Mayor Blinkley? Here. All right. Under orders of the day, I will read the following. All council members are participating remotely pursuant to the governor's executive order number N2920 in order to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The meeting is being live streamed from the city website, cityofgilroy.org, and is viewable on cable channel 17 and on Facebook Live. Public comments can be made during the meeting by watching the meeting online on Zoom at https colon forward slash forward slash rb dot gy forward slash six n f t w k or by calling six six nine nine zero zero six eight three three using meeting id eight one one nine five one five seven two nine nine and entering passcode 169972. When I call the item you wish to speak on, press star nine on your telephone keypad or use the raise your hand icon. This is all written out, everybody on the agenda as well. So it's, it's, it's in writing as well. All right, item C, employee introductions, ceremonial items. We don't have any employee introductions, but under, we actually don't have any ceremonial items either. We have presentations, and that's where I think Greg Botso, as your dad likes it pronounced, is here to give us uh, the presentation on Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization Committee annual report. Mayor, I think uh, Mr. Bozo's having issues with his audio. He had sent me a text, so just FYI. Okay then why don't we move on and come back. Christina, can you, is he trying to reach you? No, um, however, I think Vanessa Ashford is part of the HNRC, so she's here. Um, okay, all right, my notes say that uh, Greg was giving the presentation, but if Vanessa's here and would like to give it since Greg isn't on, then you can go to Vanessa. I would prefer to give Greg the opportunity. I don't have the materials. If he can't okay. do it and we go okay. back, then I'll- That's I'll fine. Go. So let's just flop the order. Let's go to the second presentation by Santa Clara County Valley Urban Forestry Alliance. And I thought that was going to be Olivia Rodriguez. Oh yeah, I see her. Okay, why don't we go there and then we'll go back to Greg and hope that he's on. All right, Olivia. All right. I will start sharing my slides. Is everyone able to see this? We are, thank you. Great, then I will get started. Okay, hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Olivia and I'm currently serving as a California Climate Action Corps Fellow through AmeriCorps. I'm placed in the County of Santa Clara's Office of Sustainability, working on the establishment of the Santa Clara Valley Urban Forestry Alliance. Here's a brief overview of this presentation as it will be split into two parts. I'll be speaking about the Alliance. Then Ashley, the planting program manager with Our City Forest, will provide more detailed information about the county funded tree planting project. 
Now I'm sure that you're all well aware of the benefits of the urban forest to which range from economic, public health, social, and of course, environmental. What I wanna highlight is the current effects of the urban heat island and its projected impacts on the city of Gilroy if the urban canopy is not expanded. Urban heat islands are areas that are significantly warmer than the surrounding rural areas, even in the absence of a heat wave. This occurs because urban areas have more concrete and asphalt, which absorbs more of the sun's energy. These heat islands disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. This graph from CalADAPT, a program developed at UC Berkeley, shows the historical and projected average number of extreme heat days, those over 96.8 degrees. An excerpt from the Gilroy Dispatch published last summer reads, in 2020, Gilroy hit a scorching 115 degrees on August 16th during a record-breaking weekend as the heat wave continues to bake the state. According to Weather Service data, this temperature beat the 2019 record of 107 for the day. According to the CDC, despite the fact that all heat-related illnesses and deaths are entirely preventable, approximately 600 Americans die from heat-related causes every year, making extreme heat the top weather-related killer, more so than hurricanes and tornadoes combined. Making this nearly 10 degree temperature jump seen from 2019 to 2020, alarming for what will be in store for the years to come. Compounding this with the CDC's reports that most heat related deaths occur in urban areas. This trend of extreme heat in Gilroy can be mitigated through the expansion of the urban canopy. Neighborhoods with fewer trees and plants feel hotter than those with more green space and vegetation. EPA research has shown that shading surfaces may reduce peak surface temperatures by 20 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the planting of trees is a short-term solution, which requires long-term maintenance and care to, expend, to eventually experience the benefits. The Santa Clara Valley Urban Forestry Alliance can provide your city with the tools necessary to support and maintain the urban forest that will in turn reduce the severity of the urban heat island effect. The current or working vision for this alliance is at its very basis, the facilitation of collaboration and communication in urban forestry management throughout the county. This alliance will be producing database solutions when contributing to the expansion of the urban canopy to combat the negative impacts of climate change, especially in areas where historically vulnerable populations suffer disproportionately. I wanna emphasize that there's no monetary commitment associated with participating in the alliance. This program will leverage the resources that already exist and are in place throughout the county. At this time, participants have been asked to commit one hour quarterly to alliance related projects. So how will this alliance work? Many of the municipalities within the county are working in silos. Just as nature knows no borders, the Alliance aims to work cross-jurisdictionally. Currently, municipalities are investing their resources to develop systems and methodologies within policy, education, technical advisory, operations, maintenance, and funding that others within the county have likely pursued as well. Individualistic work is effective with enough resources, but is not the most efficient. Participation in this alliance would provide municipalities with these resources that would otherwise come at a high cost to develop individually. We see this alliance as a sort of toolbox of knowledge and subject expertise that can be accessed during any stage of the urban forestry management program development. For example, if Gilroy were to choose to participate, you would be able to adapt systems such as the County of Santa Clara's ecologically based tree guide to best select species for open plots, modify the maintenance schedule that the city of San Jose has established, to implement more preventative care for your urban forest or tailor the city of Palo Alto's canopy analysis methodologies. This alliance will eventually result in the standardization and centralization of these six subjects and transition to operating as a singular entity. All of the entities shown here have been contacted by the alliance. Currently, 12 of the municipalities within the county have committed to participating as well as two of the urban forestry focused NGOs. What is the Alliance asking of your council? Firstly, we are requesting for the city of Gilroy to consider joining the Alliance. Second, provide the lived experience to the data results. We need your help in identifying areas with disproportionately low canopy coverage within your city. And finally, be the facilitators between this Alliance and the community. This can be done through the Parks and Recreation Subcommission that has been established or through the creation of an additional internal participatory group the details of which will be left to you all how best to conduct this. Here's the working timeline for the Santa Clara Valley Urban Forestry Alliance, where, have I, where I have established the key stages that have been completed as well as identified our projected targets. 
Because the Alliance is a new project, having only begun last summer, the work that is conducted now is foundational for the future of urban forestry within the county. One of my colleagues often talks about how the benefits of this alliance will be seen far after we have all retired and into the next generation. We are hoping that this alliance will be a lasting, self-sustaining program that will help improve equity and tree canopy coverage throughout the county and complement current climate change mitigation efforts. That was the conclusion of my portion of the presentation. I'll now turn it over to Ashley with our city forest. Hello. Uh, hey, hello, you. Ashley. Okay, I just wanna make sure you're, you're mindful of the time, okay? That one, you were, that was six minutes. We're trying to keep everything under 10 because we've got a lot of reports, okay? Go ahead. Sure, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'll jump right into it. Um, you can switch slides, Olivia. Um, yeah, if you're not familiar with our organization, uh, we are an urban forestry nonprofit located in San Jose, formed in 1994, and I've been working to green Silicon Valley ever since. Next slide. Um, so briefly by the numbers, we've planted um, over 90,000 trees and shrubs, completed um, over 20,000 projects, engaged over 200,000 volunteers, um, provided job training to 500 AmeriCorps members and have maintained a 95% plant survival rate. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, but we do offer a wide variety of services, but just to focus on our tree planting services, as you can see, there's a lot more to it than just physically putting the trees in the ground. We do um, a lot of work beforehand to make sure that the right tree is planted in the right place. Um, so conducting a site visit from one of our staff arborists, um, obtaining the necessary permits and making sure there's no utility conflicts. Um, we also provide full support on project day uh, plantings, such as providing the tools and trees, as well as volunteers and knowledgeable coaches. Uh, but most importantly, we make sure that there is a proper maintenance plan to make sure that the trees do succeed um, so that they can grow to maturity where they really uh, start to they really provide their full amount of benefits to the community. Um, if they're not provided proper support um, in their establishment period, they you know, will need to be replanted, replaced, which is costly. It can be a public health hazard. So we really um, make sure that that's established. Come to the next slide. Um, we plant in all sorts of sites. Um, so private properties, public properties, such as parks and schools, uh, government facilities, city-owned areas such as medians and backups. If there's anywhere you want to see a tree, we will come out and see if we can make it work. Can go to the next slide. Um, as you can see, it is the northeast corridor of Gilroy that has been identified as the area with the lowest canopy coverage. So this is where we would like to focus our tree plantings. Um, okay, Ashley, you have a minute left if you want to be aware of that. Okay. Um, and the Gilroy um, Parks and Rec Commission has been given this map and is working to identify sites to plant. Next slide. Um, we do have a lot of community partners and knowledgeable staff to make this all work. We can talk about that at another time. Um, next slide. But the really important part is looking at the benefits of this partnership, you know, filling a core city service void raising substantial non-city dollars together, saving city staff time and money while promoting best practices and consistent care to make sure that these trees survive, maximizing community involvement, which is a big part of our mission, um, you know, education, engagement, volunteerism, while increasing um, greening capacity in Gilroy, so leaving a legacy of a healthy urban forest. And that is all I have for you today. Um, please feel free to you can go to the next slide. I included myself and Rhonda as contacts. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I don't know if you're aware, Gilroy is a tree city. So we, we've not been lacking in, uh, in making sure we plant plenty of trees, but we very much thank you for your time to come down and tell us about your organization and what you're doing. All right, thank you. Okay, Greg, have you made it on? So Greg is here, but he's listed as an attendee as opposed to a panelist. So I'm okay. not sure if he has the capacity. To okay, go so Christina or Leanne, whoever's, uh, can someone let him in? He's uh, been promoted to panelists. Great. I'm on, right. I'm on 
Great. Good. Okay, Greg, you are on. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> Sorry about being late. It's okay. Um, I'm timing you. Go. <laughs> all right, too. Uh, I'm here to update you guys on the um, community neighbor, uh, excuse me, housing neighborhood revitalization committee. Um, we are right now a group of six. We have one, a vacancy of one. We were formed uh, as recently as 2020 when the um, community neighborhood revitalization committee was merged with the housing advisory committee that started in 2020. So now we call ourselves for short HNRC otherwise known as Housing Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. Uh, second slide, please. Some of the uh, council appointed tasks that we were given when the new uh, um, committee was formed was um, to review and recommend community development block grant and the housing trust fund allocation. So community development block grant, what is that? That is federal funds that come into our community that are earmarked for things like poverty, blight, hunger, and housing issues. So um, some of the organizations that come in um, to um, apply for money like, like that are, are organizations like uh, St. Joseph's Center, uh, the Street Team, the Live Oak uh, Daycare, and Meals on Wheels. Um, housing Trust Fund um, groups that come in looking for um, Funding would be something like a rebuilding Silicon Valley. They aren't based in Gilroy, but they do a lot of work in Gilroy. And um, I think uh, people would be happy to know that um, this organization um, strictly goes after homeowners that would now fall into a low income and have some how, um, repairs needed on their homes that they couldn't do themselves. Most, most of the time they're elderly and they take over those to keep their people in their homes. So um, that's the main thing. Uh, one of the council appointed tasks that we do. Uh, we've also in the past um, studied, studied the uh, neighborhood revitalization strategy area, which is uh, sort of in the downtown and moves east and west a little bit. We're waiting for um, updated information on that to do that again this year. Um, we also, um, which came when we combined with the housing advisory committee is um, we are tasked with study and advising on housing and affordable housing related issues in Gilroy. And that is something that we're interested in doing more of, but we would uh, request uh, more, more tangible um, actions from the council to request us to do something. We haven't done a whole lot of, of that. Um, uh, other things that we do are perform uh, duties related to the CDBG money and the housing trust fund matters uh, that may be prescribed by council. Once again, we are interested in waiting for more tangible things that we could get um, our hands on. One of the things that's challenging about our um, task is the um, community development black block grant fund is data, 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 data driven. And after that's over, we're overwhelmed with data and we're all interested in something uh, that we can get our hands on. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we have a work plan. We have review and recommended approval of the 20 to 2025 consolidated plan. Um, the next thing is align committee efforts to implement the um, consolidated plan. So that would be the annual action plan of, of the consolidated plan that we, um, we reviewed and, and um, gave recommendations on. We are still waiting for the fair housing assessment plan. So we're looking forward to that. Um, one other thing that we um, are trying to do is maybe organize a more of a grassroots conversation just within our own committee, just an unofficial, something that we can do to help the least vulnerable uh, people in Gilroy that have housing and poverty issues. And when I say least vulnerable, we mean folks that, um, that don't necessarily need a ton of services, but maybe somebody just needs a hand and a help and a room or a cottage or something. So our committee um, has decided that we would like to do something like that unofficially, just as a committee to see if we can help people. Um, the other thing on the work plan is engage the community on long-term uh, CDBG capital funding. Of course, that means uh, we need a lot of money for that, but we always wanna keep the door open. If people feel like they um, have a, a project that's good for capital uh, CDBG money or housing trust fund money, they're welcome to apply. Uh, we also wanna reimagine youth services for the future. 
Um, we have activities in 2021. I know I'm going a little bit late here. Um, one of the things that uh, I will close with is that we do know that um, there's been turnover on our own committee and there's also turnover at City Hall. And, and that's something that we're looking forward to kind of closing that gap. Our group has been together for quite some time now and we're looking to have a little bit more cohesiveness in our organization so we can, in our committee so we can do more. Thank you. Okay, is, is the presentation done or is this where Vanessa takes over? Uh, if you wanna give us more time, okay. Vanessa may have a couple comments. I have a question on that last slide. What do you mean by youth, youth center activities? Wh which youth center? You mean the boxing center? Which youth center? Yeah, so um, at one point during the year, uh, a conversation and started at our committee when during COVID, unfortunately, the swimming um, got canceled. And then part of our task was to uh, um, recommend reallocation of money from swimming to youth, to the youth services and, and, and boxing. So we did that. So we started a conversation is, can we expand on youth services? That's what that okay, was. Okay, so this, this means at the youth center though. Youth services yeah. at the youth center. Okay, yeah. that's what I was asking. Okay, yeah, sorry. thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see, uh, Vanessa, that was, so we're at six and a half minutes. Did you have something you wanted to add? I would only add if uh, we could show the last slide, the very last slide. Um, so so what we are as a committee, um, there is the task of studying housing needs and uh, providing feedback uh, or recommendations to council we don't have a process in place for that. And so we as a committee would ask um, to be involved more in housing planning and then to develop a communication channel because right now we, we don't have the opportunity to study or to provide feedback. So that's why we would ask, what does council want the HNRC to do to provide feedback? And that, that would be the end of our presentation. Okay, council members, does anyone have any questions for our committee members who are here tonight? I see Rebecca's hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg and Vanessa, for your, for your hard work and your commitment to our community and being part of this committee. I, um, when I was on the Housing Advisory Committee as part of the Planning Commission, I, I feel like we had the same issue in that we wanted to uh, develop our work plan and do some real like hands-on work, something that we could, you know, sink our teeth into and have like a tangible outcome. And it and it felt very much like um, we could talk about it for a long time and uh, get some feedback from staff and then talk about it some more and not move forward. But I would love to um, um, support support some efforts like this, a community-wide housing survey, um, things like that that would be part of the official um, work of the city, uh, you know, through your committee. So that's something we tried to undertake and it didn't uh, come to fruition, but, but um, I think it's a good first step if you all want to um, survey the community on, on housing needs. Thanks. Okay, anyone else with questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you both. Thank you for all that you do. All right. And for sharing it with us today. Okay. Um, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye. All right. Um, all right. This is um, uh, Christina. Do we have any members of the public who are wanting to speak on items not on tonight's agenda? Yes, we have someone raising their hand. Marco Antonio Salazar, you may speak. Hello? Yes. Hi. Is... Um, okay. This is Marco Salazar. Uh, and I was trying to propose an idea to get a new park open in Gilroy, like a new skate park open. Uh, I was wondering if this would be the right place to do that. This is for items not on the agenda, and that is not on the agenda, so yes. You see okay. this, there's a the timer, okay. All right, so basically I just wanted to see what it would take to get a new park going here. 
and uh, this has been in the works for a few months, and it's the first time actually talking to a city, to like the city. And what would it? What would some? What's? What would it be? What would be required to open up a new park here in Gilroy? A new park? You mean like new skate park? New skate park? Oh, a skate park. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, that would mean. Um, Starting with one of our, uh, I don't know, Jimmy, do you want to answer that? Or do we have somebody here to answer that more specifically? Because I would be going straight to our uh, uh, recreation department or somebody in, in there. I don't know if that's, I, I don't think that's bike and ped because we have a skate park. And I don't know yeah. that anybody planning, anyone's got money to build another skate, skate park. Well, the money won't be the problem now. So we might have some funding available. And we just want to know what it would take to like. How to start the one... discussion. Yeah. How to start the discussion. Okay, yeah. Jimmy, do you want to, are you able to answer that? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would actually advise um, the gentleman to approach the Parks and Recreation Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good grassroots group that can help uh, advise you through that process. And, and then that way, uh, staff can get involved once uh, the support of the commission uh, is, is there. But that's a good place to start. All right. Okay. Uh, Does that sound color? Uh, yeah. Would you guys have like a contact information for them? Because I've been trying to look. Yes, uh... absolutely. Michelle Wexler is the okay. chair of the of the uh, Parks and Rec Commission. And uh -huh. you can also contact the city clerk for all of the commissioners. Okay. Um, you... website. So the contact, would you, I was trying to look for some contact information online because the first thing that I thought of was Parks and Rec. But all uh, numbers that I tried to call said that they were unavailable because the city was closed. And uh, I tried going up to the city hall. And then, of course, it's closed. No, our commissioners, it's email. You, you need to use okay. email for the commissioner. Yeah, I was okay? trying to look for an email address. Would you guys have one available right now? Or would I have to look for that on the website? <laughs> Is that OK to announce or what, Jimmy? <laughs> Mayor, I, uh, sir, can you just send an email to cityclerk at cityofgilroy.org? And they'll route that to the people that can help you. All right, city clerk at city of gmail .com. I mean, city of city Gilroy. Gilroy. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. City of Gilroy org. Okay, org. Okay. Sorry, I'm nervous. I've been this is the That's first time okay. we have to talk. Our first okay. step. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any other uh, public comments? Christina, is that it? Uh, we have Danielle um, Arbanides. Uh, you may speak. Um, hi, I'm assuming this is the time when we can talk about the firework situation. No, no, because that is on the agenda. Okay. This is a time for things not on the agenda. Got it. So thank that's you. coming up. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I see no one else. Okay. Then uh, we move on to reports of council members and we start with council member Bracco. Yes, I uh, attended the Santa Clara County Homeless Task Force meeting uh, last week. And um, they had all the cities give a report on what they're doing uh, to help with the homeless issues in Santa Clara County. Um, we got, one of the really interesting things that came out was that of all the new housing being built in California, only 12% is low income. And uh, the supervisors are going to be looking into getting some incentives from the state to try to help with that, to get that number up. Um, I gave our presentation and I thank Jimmy and staff for helping me with that. Um, our, our, actually our presentation got the uh, most feedback. And uh, in particular, a homeless gentleman that calls in on just about every issue called in and commended us on what we're doing, that we're thinking outside the box and not doing the same thing over and over again. And he commented, that um, the homeless of today are not the same as they were 10 years ago. There's a lot more violence. The homeless camps are very, very uh, dangerous. And 
he he really thought the idea of hiring the quality of life officers was going to help with the safety inside the camps. Um, I also I pushed back on, on Supervisor Chavez because the county has the Measure A funds, but none of that's coming to South County. So she's going to uh, work on that. She said she would work on that and see why we're not getting any funding down here and see what she could do to help us get that funding. Thank you. Thanks, Dion. The only thing I'll say to that is um, the VTA uh, project, you know, that would be Measure A funding. So that would be 150 units with Measure A funding here in Gilroy, just so people know. All right, um, Council Member Armendaris. Sure. Um, actually, I believe that uh, the Monterey <laughs> Gateway used some Measure A funds too, right? Oh, it did. Those 75 yeah. units, absolutely. But that's all. <laughs> that's It's not a lot. Yeah. No, it's not enough. And um, and there's some properties that I've recommended to the county to um, where they could um, develop, but that's not my report. Um, so I attended the Historic Heritage Committee meeting and they um, are preparing their report, their work plan for our, um, to present to us in the next couple of months, I believe in August. Um, and they have some new members. So they're getting one, everyone up to speed on uh, what their role is and really streamlining what they feel is um, their role within our committee, our community. Um, I attended the um, Gilroy Downtown Business Association um, meeting and there is something coming up on Saturday um, to show a demonstration of what Gourmet Alley would look like um, or, um, you know, somewhat what it would look like, right? And uh, for the community. And um, that was it. That was it for this All month. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Council Member Marks. Yes, I have some Gilroy Garden important dates for the public. On June 23rd, Water Oasis is reopening. On June 26th, we'll be celebrating Gilroy Gardens. It's actually their 21st birthday, but we'll be cel celebrating uh, number 20 just because of COVID. Plenty of sprinkles will be on hand for anyone who's attending that day. And also on July 3rd and July 4th, Ken Christopher wrote a book called Elephant Garlic, and he will be at Gilray Gardens reading to the small children, and he's going to be giving away 2,000 copies of his book. So just go ahead and please go to Gilray Gardens website to look for the times that Ken will be there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blankley. Um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy is impl implementing communication efforts to inform customers and local stakeholders about possible summer flex alerts and energy emergencies. While the state is in a better position this summer with additional generating capacity and other market reforms, we are still preparing for the need for conservation and preparation during certain time periods of extreme weather events. SVC will activate notices and messaging calling on customers to conserve and how to prepare. SVC will share a summer readiness digital media toolkit with municipalities to use to inform businesses and residents of these events. The board approved a resolution to support the Beyond Gasoline Initiative. Led by joint venture Silicon Valley, the, initiati the initiative's goal of cutting gasoline consumption in Silicon Valley by 50% by, by 2030. They are well aligned for SVCE's mission and effort efforts to support electrical electric vehicle adoption. The board discussed the changing environment in the external energy landscape and internal challenges. In response, the board discussed several strategic focus areas to adapt to these changes. These include strengthening staffing, mo moving to an operations mode, ensuring financial stability, determining renewable and clean energy targets, and also ensuring development of a cyber risk management plan. Um, I'm looking forward to attending, uh, and the public is invited to attend the Association of Bay Area Governments, uh, ABAG, their General Assembly meeting is this Friday at nine. And lastly, I'd just like to say kudos to our staff, Rochelle and uh, Bedell, our PIO and, and staff for the social media series they, present, they sell, so presented on celebration of Pride Month. And the final words that they wrote in the Gilroy Express newsletter really hit me well too. Um, I couldn't be more proud to work, serve, and live in such a great city that is pushing messages forward such as that. Thank you. 
Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, as things are starting to open up now, I wanna, first of all, thank all of you that have encouraged your friends and neighbors to go out and get their vaccination. So thank you everybody for um, pushing that forward and encouraging your friends and family. I also wanna thank the community for uh, going out and supporting our local businesses and restaurants. Um, I've had the opportunity to go out there and see many people that are visiting and uh, dining inside now. So it's great to see uh, Gilroy starting to open up again. So thank you to the community. Finally, I wanna um, congratulate uh, the Mila's restaurant. Um, they recently just celebrated their 10th year in, in business here in Gilroy. And as many of you know, it's an iconic restaurant, a haunted building, um, and it's a talking point for many people. And uh, I was there uh, last week, the week before, and just sort of having conversations with folks and it's good. And I'm good to see, you, and I'm glad that uh, our residents are out there supporting our local businesses. That's it, thank you. All right, Council Member Leromunoz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Association of Bay Area Governments will have its quarterly meeting this Friday. I will attend on behalf of Gilroy. Business to be transacted includes uh, adopting a proposed budget as well as a work plan for fiscal year 21-22. So I will be happy to report back at our next meeting what is on that work plan and what that budget looks like. That's it. Thank you. And yes, you are our council appointed representative to ABAG. So thank you for attending and for reporting back to us. Okay. Um, my report, um, really, we, we all, all are trying to push out the, the getting vaccinated thing. That's for sure. So um, that hasn't ended. And if anyone's out there that hasn't been vaccinated and is willing to do so, or if you just have a some little reservation, please talk to somebody. The more we can get vaccinated, the, the better, not trying to push those who have something against it, but certainly wanna push those who, who uh, with a nudge would be willing to get vaccinated. We are trying to get to 85% and uh, the, the county as a whole is pretty much at 80. So it's, it's looking good. And then I also wanna share that the 568 bus is going to be restarting up if it hasn't already i was i was told by bta that it's going to start with the academic year of san jose state but just today i thought maybe they they moved that up so anyway it's either already started or it's about to start the 168 is the express that's the thing of the past but the 568 will be operating in addition to the 68 and the 568 is a, a quicker ride to san jose it's every 30 minutes all day long so that's that's something to to look forward to. It's really going to help in the bus service. OK, with that, I'm moving on to future council initiated agenda items and asking if anybody has um, an item they want to mention here. I see a hand by council member Marks. Uh, yes, a citizen's request that went to all council members asked for the following flags to be flown at City Hall during the following months, September firefighter. October, National Breast Cancer, February, American Heart, April, National Autism, and May, Law Enforcement slash Peace Officers Memorial Month. In order to address this citizen's request, may this be put on a future agenda for discussion. Okay, uh, Council Member Bracco, I see your hand up. I also uh, received a request from uh, Phil Larson that uh, he thought it would uh, be nice to fly the uh, thin blue line flag in the uh, month of July to commemorate the officers that saved the, uh, we don't know how many lives they saved at the garlic festival shooting. And uh, he would like that put on an agenda. Right. Okay. I'm familiar with the one that Council Member Marks referred to because I know we all got that one. I don't believe I got one from Phil Larson, but but okay, so you're bringing that one. Um, here's what I'd like to say before we uh, see if we want to put this on a future agenda. I think we've learned a lot from what we've all just been through recently and that we can do better going forward. So if it's the will of the Council to agendize uh, requested flags for future discussion, May I ask, and I'll ask the, the proposers of this, so Council Member Marks and Council Member Bracco, may I ask that we also revisit the flag policy to discuss with staff what we learned and how best to move forward with these requests. Can I, can, will you uh, amend your request to include that 
and then at the same time at the same meeting talk about the flags you're asking to talk about would that be okay to be the 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 not the motion but the request of the council to see if we want a future agenda item that's fine with me that would be fine Okay, so, okay, Council Member Tovar, we're not discussing anything. I'm just gonna see if we wanna put this on a future agenda. Yeah, no, and no. I just wanted to make sure that the, that staff has a chance to participate in the problems that, that the difficulties they had with our last go around so right. we can get those all ironed out. Yeah, no, now I was just to make a suggestion that they might wanna look at the policy that Hollister put in place uh, in regards to flag raising it might be something that maybe okay so again that's that's to be discussed if we decide to put this on an agenda of course. right okay so so we need to first so what i'm looking for then is a um thumbs up see if we have a majority of the council that would like to and we'll probably if this if we decide to do this i'm thinking um in september is when i can see it possibly going on the agenda it's not going to go before that but so a lot of these these issues may not be till 2022, you know, the rashly flying flags. But um, so if we have a, a majority of the council that wants to revisit this item, then can I please have a thumbs up for, for those people? And I am looking at I can't see Council Member Hilton at all. We just put all those together. Is that what you're proposing You're to look at the policy again as well? To look at the policy and to discuss those flags doesn't mean okay. you have to like them all. It just means that, that we can discuss them because citizens have raised those flags. So it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm Hilton, not interested in the policy because I'm not interested in the policy change. Then you would be a thumbs down, right? Okay, so that would be, uh, that is one thumbs down. And Fred, I'm sorry, did you have, okay, so it's, the, it passes, we will future agendize six to one with council member Hilton being uh, against the discussion for the flag policy and the, uh, and the flags that have been requested by other members of the public. Mayor, okay. and again, if I may, Mayor, again, now that we've passed this, I would, I would recommend that staff look at the policy that Hollister has in place. It may be useful for us. Okay. Thank you. So noted. Okay, so hopefully September, not making any promises, but at least we can get this addressed. Okay, uh, consent calendar. Does anybody want to make a motion or talk specifically about any particular item on consent? I'll make a motion to approve the consent items. I'll second. Okay, and a second. Dion, I saw your hand, but you're on mute, so I didn't know what you were trying to say. I wasn't fast enough. Peter beat me to it. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member LaRomagno, seconded by Council Member Tovar to approve the consent calendar. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Armandari? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member LaRomagno? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right, that passed uh, seven to zero. Okay, bids and proposals, item seven. Authorize the city administrator to enter into an agreement to purchase a replacement police. Oh, sorry, I think, Jimmy, are we gonna postpone this to July 1st? Yes, Madam Mayor, under consultation with the city attorney, we feel there's a better way to do this staff report that would uh, give us a little better footing. So we're asking council to not take up this agenda item tonight and we'll return on July 1st. Okay, so do I need to do anything about that formally? I think the, it, because it's agendized, the council, at least there was a hands motion has to agree to it. Okay, to thumbs up to postpone this to July 1st. Okay, everybody. Very good. That's a unanimous thumbs up to postpone. Okay, item, nope, no item B. Item 8A. This is the item we've had to postpone twice. So finally, it's been properly noticed in the dispatch and we can actually uh, discuss this. So this is to conduct a Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act public hearing, TEFRA, and approval of the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority for an affordable housing project located at 1520 Hecker Pass Highway and Craig. You Thank are you. on. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. I'll try to make this very brief. So GEMCOR Development Partners has asked for uh, financing authority 
uh, using tax exempt bonds. The California Municipal Finance Authority has been selected to help them with that endeavor. Uh, they have actually came to us in October and uh, gotten a resolution approved, but they had to switch uh, uh, tax exempt financing authority agencies. Uh, so that's why we're revisiting this and asking for a new hearing to issue new bonds. So uh, issuance of the bonds and conducting of the local public hearing is a requirement um, through, the, through the IRS. So conducting the local hearing is, is a requirement that the city is, does on behalf of the uh, agency. Uh, but there is no financial responsibility to the city or the state for these bonds. It's solely the responsibility of the borrower to pay back the bonds. We are just a conduit for conducting the hearing on their behalf. Uh, this project at 1520 Hecker Pass Highway uh, has already been approved by the city for 100 uh, affordable housing apartment pro uh, units. And the project does comply with all of our zoning and general plan reg regulations. So. We're recommending that the council uh, take action to approve the resolution tonight to allow these financing bonds to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. All right, uh, council, I'll first uh, ask if anybody has any questions of Craig before I move on down the agenda. Okay, seeing, seeing no hands. Um, does anyone have any uh, disclosure of ex parte communications on this item? No, okay. Um, then I'd like to open the public hearing. Do we have anyone who'd like to speak on this item? Anyone wishing to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. Thank you. So I'll close the public hearing. And that means uh, ready for a motion if somebody would like to make one. Move. Approval. Also, okay, can... Council Member Tovar made the motion, seconded by Council Member Bracco, to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy approving the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $30 million for the purpose of financing or refinancing the acquisition and construction of Hecker Pass Apartments Project. Roll call vote. Council Member Armandaris? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Laura Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blinkley? Yes. And that passes unanimously. All right, item B. Introduce an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilroy amending the Gilroy City Code Chapter 30 zoning, Article 34 fences and obstructions to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zoned properties subject to specified criteria in the ordinance. And Cindy, I believe you're gonna give us the staff report, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you, you are on. The application before you is a request to amend the city code to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems in the city of Gilroy. Oh, hold on, it's not advancing. There we go. Due to clients' concerns about theft and vandalism, the applicant is requesting an amendment to the city's fence ordinance to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zone properties. This is a photo provided by the applicant showing damage and trespassing at Cresco Equipment Rental on Auto Mall Parkway. As provided in the staff report, the monitored security fence system would include an electrified fence located behind a separate non-electrified perimeter fence in order to prevent inadvertent access to the electrified security system. The system includes an audible alarm which sounds when the fence line is breached after which a signal is sent to the security provider's monitoring station, who will then notify the business. The business must first verify the alarm event, and only then will deployment of law enforcement be requested, thereby minimizing unnecessary calls for service. In addition to a building permit, an alarm system permit must be approved by the police department prior to installation. The de design standards required under the ordinance will also help to ensure that the electrified fence will be visually transparent 
as seen from the public right of way and adjacent properties as shown here. On May 13th, the Planning Commission made the required findings for approval and recommended that the City Council introduce the ordinance with one modification. As shown here, the draft ordinance now specifies the requirement of bilingual signage. Staff recommends that the Council introduce the ordinance to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zone properties subject to specified criteria in the ordinance. This concludes my presentation. Let me know if you have any questions. We also have Keith Kaniko here from um, the applicant. So I'm gonna stop. Thank, thank you, thank you, Cindy, very much. Uh, Council Member Leromagnos, I see you have your hand up. So I'll start with you. Great, Cindy, thank you for the report. Um, and, I, and I like the, the recommendation to have those signs bilingual. My question is, and this is kind of a silly question, but I don't, I don't understand. Uh, what is the physical impact to somebody if they were to actually touch something with, uh, it looked like 7,000 volts? Do you have any uh, idea what the physical impact would be? I'll let Keith answer that. This actually came up at the planning commission meeting as well. Council member uh, Leroy Munoz, uh, thank you for that question. Um, certainly, yeah, that's a common question that does come up. Um, so I'll explain it to you um, kind of in two ways technically and also practically. I guess I'll start with practically. So practically, um, the sensation and duration is like a static shock, okay? Static shocks in and of themselves could actually be up to 20,000 volts. Um, this instance, again, you get the same reaction. If one were to come in contact uh, with the security fence portion of the security system, the reaction would be just like a static shock. You get popped and then you back off. Uh, the key point here is we kind of segue into the technical, I guess, explanation is that it is not continuous current. So when you mentioned that 7,000 volts, it is a pulse of electricity, less than a millisecond. It's 0. 0.00030 seconds in, in duration or length. That pulse occurs every 1.3 seconds. So the fence is not continuously uh, charged by electricity. It's only every 1.3 seconds. It sends that basically kind of static pulse through the whole system. Uh, but again, practically speaking, and I've unfortunately, I've had to demonstrate it. <laughs> um, and the reaction is, is like, ooh, you shake your hand and go, ooh, I don't want to do that again. Understood. Keith, thank you very much for the explanation. Yeah, and before I go to the to Council Member Armendariz's question, I think it's important to reiterate for the council, unless I misunderstood, that this is a secondary uh, security fence. The first fence is not electrified. So someone has to first be intentionally trying to break through that fence before they then encounter the second fence that is electrified. So this is this is because the applicant is, you know, they're beside themselves with people constantly cutting through their fence. Okay, Council Member Armendariz. Thank you. Um, my question is, what kind of maintenance requirements um, can we add to this? Because from what I've read about electric fences, the um, most dangerous um, issues come from poor maintenance or damaging or damages, right? Damaged uh, fences, that's when they can become very dangerous and unstable. And what kind of um, animals can they affect at that wattage? Okay. Uh, very or good voltage, question. rather. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Amendarez. So let's see, a number of, I guess, points to make to answer your questions. Um, I guess we'll just start with your last kind of just in reference to um, effect on animals, whether it be pets or wildlife, so on and so forth. Understand that this technology is based on and must comply with an international safety standard. And it is International Electrotechnical Commission Standard 60335-2-76. That is the world's basically foremost standard uh, for this type of security system, this type of security fence, um, which also is adopted by the state of California under civil code section 835, um, and is also referenced in the um, actual draft language before you tonight. Um, well, what does that practically mean and how does it relate to wildlife and pets and so forth? Um, practically speaking, this technology comes from the animal containment technology, cattle fences. 
but it operates at anywhere from one third to one quarter of the power. Uh, because think about a 2000 pound animal, cow or whatever the case may be, that requires a lot more power, uh, obviously to deter you know, that animal from, from wanting to leave the, the containment. In our instance, the security technology operates at much, much less power, much less voltage. So from a safety perspective, there is no concerns with regard to wildlife and animals, pets, cats, dogs, et cetera. Um, that same kind of just momentary pulse of electricity, the same reason why that is safe, it is also safe also for wildlife. Um, there were third party studies done as well. Um, and truthfully, some of the test subjects, you know, were a kind of a wide range of animals from mice all the way up to a pony, which obviously represented um, you know, uh, someone that's, you know, adult sized um, and there were no adverse effects. So the, that standard has established the threshold by which the amount of charge or energy that can go through the fence. Um, also keep in mind too, um, you think about like birds. I mean, for the same reason why birds can land on a high voltage, you know, continuous current line and not get hurt because they're not grounded. Um, and our system operates similarly. If some were, something were to contact or perch on top, there's, there's not gonna be any issues. And if they did happen somehow get grounded some way, somehow, again, that momentary pulse of electricity is not gonna be a concern with regard to uh, wildlife and pets children, people with pacemakers. I mean, it's this was all thoroughly vetted at the state level, state of California. Okay, thank you. Council member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Keith, I sort of have a two part question. So in regards to this particular location, how often has it has this occurred where there's been vandalism or, you know, um, a break in? I don't know the current stats. I mean, the last time I know we reviewed the property, uh, they responded that they were being hit multiple times per month. Okay. Um, so that, well, that leads to my question here. So uh, in regards, I mean, I'm in support of this, obviously, but um, as you know, I mean, just like with any city, our police already stretched thin, you know, and um, if this is something that's occurring quite often. And if our police officers are out on other calls and they're unable to get to the location prior to the, either the crime occurs or, after it occurs, is there any liability on the city or a police department for not stopping the crime if they weren't able to get there in time? Well, I guess I'll first answer that by you know, understand that this is a highly effective form of, of preventative, mm -hmm. you know, it's a preventative measure. Um, and truthfully, every single customer that we've ever installed here in the state of California said the day that this type of security system went in, their crime problem stopped. Okay. Their, excuse me, their criminal trespass problem stopped. Let me just frame that properly. Right. Um, which led to obviously theft of the property, employee endangerment and so forth. And as we kind of fold in the law enforcement side, law enforcement, they've been appreciative because a crime that doesn't happen is a crime that they don't have to respond to. And truthfully, if they do have to respond to burglary and theft, Unfortunately, it's usually after the fact. Right. I mean, criminals are quick to get in and out. And by the time, you know, police can get there, unfortunately, it's kind of, you know, it's after the fact. And unfortunately, it's just, uh, you know, so it's a difficult situation to manage. Um, with regard to liability, that uh, maybe that's more a question to your law enforcement, but certainly understand that our system in itself is monitored. Okay, so the key thing to understand, this system is not, I know the security fence element gets all kind of the glory and focus, mm -hmm. but the other fundamental element to the system, the foundational element of the system is a monitored alarm fence. So it detects, if it detects no voltage return or low voltage return uh, for, for four cycles, which equates to about five to seven seconds, it will then go into alarm mode, which this, this fence is alarmed and monitored by a central station. And that central station or operator will then contact the business to inform them that there's been a potential breach on the property. And then the onus is upon the business to confirm that there is, you know, 
a crime in progress happening on the property. I see it on my cameras. Please, you know, deploy law enforcement. And law enforcement appreciates that in that instance because then they're actually responding to a crime in progress and not just to some false alarm. Um, so certainly- Thank that, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great, this, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, I would like to ask uh, dis any ex parte communications to disclose. Anyone had conversations with the applicant or any of this? Okay, um, I'd like to open the public hearing. Do we have any public comments on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right. Then I will close. Okay, I will close the public hearing and ask for a motion. Council Member Tovar just made a motion to approve. Uh, is there a second? I'll second, second that. Council Member Leromanos. Okay, and that's to introduce an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilroy amending the Gilroy City Code, Chapter 30, Zoning, Article 34, Fences and Obstructions to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zone properties subject to the specified criteria in the ordinance. Roll call vote. Councilmember Armendariz? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Lero Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blinkley? Yes. All right, that passes unanimously. Item C. Tentative map uh, 2008 uh, to subdivide 8.95 acres into three parcels for a property located in the commercial industrial zoning district at 6605 Auto Mall Parkway, formerly Chestnut Street. All right, APN 841-16117. If you're not on mute and you have anything making noise in the background, please mute yourself. Okay, staff report, Miguel Contreras. Yes, good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members. This is Miguel Contreras with the Planning Division. I'm here to present um, TM 20-08, which proposes a subdivision of a 8.95 acre uh, commercial industrial property into three lots. Uh, city staff recommends adoption of a city council, um, a, of adoption of the city council resolution of approval. Uh, the subject property is a vacant uh, property south of 10th Street along Auto Mall Parkway, as uh, highlighted here in the red. Uh, attaches the site plan. This is how the uh, three properties um, are proposed to be subdivided. The lots will be rough graded for future development with all utilities and access available from Auto Mall Parkway. Determinations, the lots, uh, the lots support the development, uh, the lot support development and are consistent with the general services, general plan land use and commercial industrial zoning requirements. The lots can connect to existing utilities and drainage system. And uh, there's no uh, unique environmental constraints applicable to the site. So it's uh, exempt under CEQA under section 15315 of the CEQA guidelines. On June 3rd, um, during the Planning Commission hearing, the Planning Commission unanimously voted to recommend uh, City Council approve this subdivision. And once more, staff recommendation is to adopt a resolution approving tentative map uh, 20-08 as requested, subject to uh, certain findings and conditions. That concludes Great, my presentation. You. Thank you. All right, Council, um, Council members, can you uh, uh, clear the slideshow screen, please, Miguel? Thank Thanks. you. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so council, if, if there are no questions, I will go to, well, first I have to ask if there's any ex parte communications. It's on for every item here. Seeing none, um, I'll open the public hearing and see if we have any public comments. If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right. Okay, uh, thank you. So, real quick, Madam Mayor, uh, um, planning staff did receive a uh, comment from the Roads and Airports Department with uh, Santa Clara County. With uh, Santa Clara County, uh, the comment reads: 
please provide a traffic impact analysis for the individual projects once proposed land uses are determined. And, uh, that concludes their comment. Okay, would you like to address that too then? Is that something, is that something the Planning Commission heard? Uh, no, the Planning Commission did not uh, hear this comment. Okay, so how, how does staff recommend handling that comment? If I may, that's not really a comment on the map. It's really a comment on future development. Oh, okay. Thank so you I for that. I think it should be noted by staff. The appropriate thing to do is for staff to note that at this time, but it should not affect your consideration of the map. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Okay, then council, would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion for approval. All right. Council member Tovar is moving to approve. Is anyone going to second that? I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Council Member LaRomagnos is seconding, uh, approving tentative map 2008 to subdivide 8.95 acres into three parcels for a property located in the commercial industrial zoning district at 6605 Auto Mall Parkway, APN 84116117. Roll call vote. Council Member Armendariz? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Laura Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. All right, that passes unanimously. All right, we are now on item eight, excuse me, item nine of the agenda, uh, part A, which is the only part to item nine, code enforcement program update. And Karen, yes, you're going to give us a staff report, right? Karen, if you're talking, we can't hear you. All right, I'll try hitting the unmute this time a little okay. harder. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. Here we go. All right. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, this is, as you said, Karen Garner, Community Development Director. And per council's request, I'm going to be providing an update on our code enforcement program and highlighting some of the good work our team is doing, as well as discuss some areas of interest that have been uh, brought up at different times. So uh, first of all, our city's code enforcement program strives to maintain a healthy, safe, and desirable living and working environment through the city of Gilroy, throughout the city of Gilroy, and they do this by administering a fair and unbiased enforcement program to correct violations of ordinances enacted by the city council regarding property buildings and structures. So let me see, get slide advanced here. There we go. Okay, so, this is some of the roles and responsibilities of our code enforcement team. And there are certainly other ones that are that they have. I mean, really, they look at many of the non-criminal city codes and are responsible for uh, enforcing any violations. But these are the ones that we see uh, that they most commonly do address on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we compare staffing levels and, and to other cities, it is difficult. It's not really an apples to apples comparison because each city may assign different roles and responsibilities to code enforcement and to other departments and divisions like police or planning and housing. In Gilroy, our code enforcement staff actually do take on a pretty heavy uh, list of responsibilities. Uh, some of the things more recently that have come up are illegal dumping and trash pickup. That's definitely been a growing area of work for code enforcement and staff. And even as an example, this morning, we had two uh, separate uh, requests from through our, uh, our, our dispatch to pick up some, there was a couch in the alleyway behind Church Street and a couple of dressers dumped in a field. So our staff was out there picking that up today. And one of the newer responsibilities that our code enforcement staff has, has taken on is assisting with state mandated fire inspections. And so in fact, on your consent calendar uh, earlier this evening, there was approval of an annual compliance report for inspections of certain types of buildings that are 
uh, fire operations and fire prevention take on. And just because of the uh, additional work that that requires, our code enforcement staff actually helps out with those inspections. So they're, as far as uh, their kind of day-to-day -day activities, really about a third of their time is spent out in the field and about two thirds of their time is spent doing paperwork and administrative work. And I know some people um, you know, are surprised to hear that, but there really is a lot of you know, phone calls and emails and research and uh, you know, entering in the violations into our system. And that really does take a lot of time and uh, so it equates to between our two full-time code operators, of course about two-thirds of their time is spent uh, on that and you know, later this evening our chief building official will be requesting action from council on two blight cases and these cases are good examples of how long and arduous the process can be sometimes and how much administrative time these types of cases can take. Uh, I should also mention that in addition to our two full-time code enforcement officers, there is additional support from other staff, including the chief building official, management analyst, city attorney, and our contract hearing officer. And then the code enforcement staff also consult uh, with other staff. So for example, planning staff may discuss a particular zoning code violation with code enforcement to make sure all applicable codes are understood and applied correctly. Of the cases that our code enforcement team handles, over half of them are life safety issues. And I kind of like to think of life safety issues, those things that we must do, otherwise something bad could happen. So this could be anything from shoddy wiring done for an unpermitted secondary dwelling unit that could cause a fire, to an illegally dumped refrigerator in the public right of way that could be hit by a car or leak freon into the storm drains. So although every complaint is addressed with limited staffing and resources, we do need to put priorities on the life safety issues. We also look at some of the high visibility property maintenance issues. So those things that, you know, at our city entry ways that people see. And then of course, public records requests, we get a lot of public records requests. So our staff does need to respond to those as well. I wanted to talk a little bit about complaint-based versus proactive. We are a complaint-based uh, code enforcement program. A proactive program or a program that actively looks for issues, even if there's not any complaints that have been made, uh, is, you know, is challenging to, to do that type of program. So first of all, it requires greater resources and in particular staffing. Secondly, proactive programs need to be carefully thought out, prioritized, and programmed to ensure the city is not opening itself up to liability. It is critical that a proactive program is designed to ensure fair and equitable application of code enforcement efforts and that it does not single out certain property owners, locations, or business types, as an example. So there are, in fact, cities, including some here in the Bay Area, that have been sued uh, by citizens for citations resulting from proactive code enforcement programs. So we'll just share just a few photos, some of the most co common ones, the mattresses and the uh, appliances that are dumped alongside of the road. Uh, and we think, you know, this is in large part, there are additional fees when you take these items to the landfill transfer station. So rather than pay those fees, people dump them on the side of the road. And, you know, that's too why we had that recent mattress pickup program um, that was so successful because uh, people do have these items and it's a great opportunity to get rid of them. And then I, the thing I want to point out with this is, you know, this is probably our most valuable and most important piece of equipment that we have in code enforcement, which is our truck with a lift. <laughs> so, um, you know, Dennis Castro in particular is out there on a daily basis, picking things up and putting them in the truck. And, and really besides this truck, I mean, he's working with a dolly and, you know, uh, his own hands to get the stuff into the back of the truck. So that's a really important piece of equipment for us. Um, that we, we don't actually, as code enforcement, we don't have other heavy equipment or tools to assist with picking up large items. 
Uh, one of the other common things we deal with, unsafe and substandard construction. Some examples here of some wiring that's obviously old and uh, not very good. And then I wanted to show as well in the, the uh, bottom picture, you've got someone who's cut into a structural beam to place plumbing. You know, those are the types of things that our code enforcement officers are out there and making sure to keep people safe, uh, sometimes from themselves, unfortunately. And then we also deal with things like, uh, uh, you know, carport in this case that just was not taken care of and got old and is now unsafe and needs to be removed or replaced. Um, and then also unsafe living conditions. Um, you know, what people set up and, and are actually living in is, is sometimes very sad to see. Uh, and another reason why affordable housing in our community is so very important. And then unpermitted construction um, often goes hand in hand with work that's not up to building code. But in addition, sometimes we need to worry about things like, you know, uh, unpermitted construction that is within a required setback um, or is just unsafe. So in closing, our code enforcement team is small but accomplishes a lot and much of which goes unnoticed. They're out there early in the morning picking up illegally dumped items before they become a hazard. They meet with property owners to address issues before they get to become bigger issues. We do have about 260 open cases right now, which is, is you know, pretty, pretty average. Most of those will get resolved. Um, some get resolved within a matter of days or weeks. Others take months, or as again, you'll hear later, sometimes even takes years. We are looking forward to the integration of Intergov, our land management system, which does have a code enforcement component that will allow more work to be done in the field, as well as better tracking and reporting of cases. Finally, I do want to recognize our two code enforcement officers directly, Scott Barron and Dennis Castro. They often have a thankless job, but they are very professional and truly dedicated to keeping Gilroy a safe and livable community. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, Hippolito Olmos, our chief building official who oversees code enforcement, and Scott Barron are also available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that presentation. Before I go to council with questions, um, Andy, I would like to ask you if you wouldn't mind speaking a bit to current lawsuits with uh, proactive code enforcement. Uh, sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. This is a, an interesting situation because um, it often seems like a good idea to do proactive enforcement and, and sort of clean up the, the neighborhoods in different parts. What we've seen uh, in recent times is a sensitivity on the part of um, individuals uh, about their rights and claims that they're being discriminated against or singled out. So for example, we're concerned if we have proactive enforcement, we'd have to have very strict protocols because it, it may well be in most cities that construction quality and illegal building may be greater in some neighborhoods than others. If citations are given in those neighborhoods, the city may well be accused of discrimination based on racial or ethnic or economic factors. And uh, we're, we're personally aware of a, a case up the peninsula where it's basically a neighborhood dispute between two homeowners. The city red tagged some illegal work uh, and uh, some construction that was being done without a permit. And they got sued by that homeowner and they're actually fighting that suit. It's cost them several hundred thousand dollars already in federal court on an allegation that the city discriminated and violated this individual's, this homeowner's federal civil rights based on his ethnicity because he came from a certain country and he says, the city is biased against people from my country. So, and, then, and that's, that's in federal court right now. So I mentioned that just to show the sensitivity of these issues. And in general, from a liability standpoint, if the city reacts to complaints, there isn't liability typically for why did you go and, and, and do code enforcement over here and not over here? Or why did you not do it someplace? Uh, and so that's why most cities in fact do complaint-based um, code enforcement in, in part. It's, it's partly a, re a question of, re of staff resources as Karen mentioned but it also is less likely to lead to liability in our opinion. All right, thank you. Okay, council, um, 
Before I go to public comment, do, okay, I see Council Member Marks's hand raised. Council Member Marks, you're on mute. Okay, there I go. Uh, it seems really confusing to me to have um, ordinances that are pretty much black and white and then, be, and then be told that you can't use them for fear of being sued. But I guess where I'm mostly concerned are the businesses because I'm more concerned about the economic value that new businesses could bring to Gilroy. And in order for them to come, our city needs to be showcased really, really well. And we have some businesses that are looking very shabby. El Amigo over by Home Depot is a total mess sometimes because of all the garbage that gets dumped there. I don't know who owns it. It's been for sale for probably over 20 years, but code enforcement needs to deal with that because it doesn't look good for Gilroy. Then we have Foster Freeze that's caving in on itself if you drive to the back of the building. Um, I know that Cal the state owns the clover leaf on 10th and 101 on the east side. It recently burned, but the mess is still there. That's a gateway. I'm really concerned that we're shooting ourselves in the foot. If we constantly kind of not turn a blind eye, but we sit back and we worry about lawsuits, we worry about different things, and yet we're, we're losing potential businesses because Gilroy gives the appearance that we don't care. And I don't want us to have the appearance that we don't care. We do care. I think all of us care. Code enforcement cares. I, th I think Scott and Dennis do a wonderful job. Uh, they have a hard job. But I'm frustrated because I feel that we can do more. And I'm frustrated because I feel code enforcement just keeps doing you know, the same work and the same job over and over and over again. I, I sit back and I just keep thinking, how can we make their lives easier? How can we make things more efficient? How can um, we get more stuff done? And those are all the questions that I think we all need to think about. Uh, how can we help them out? Because th this problem with the trash isn't going away. And, and I laughed when I saw the pickup right now, because all of a sudden the first thought that came to my mind was our trash comp garbage trash compactor that uh, the, the unhoused committee suggested. That would certainly help Dennis out a lot. But anyway, okay. those are my, that's my two cents worth. Okay. Karen, do you want to respond to any of the particular items that she described so we could better understand why those items, rem those places remain as they are? Yeah, in, in uh, some of the cases, like I know foster freeze is when code enforcement staff has reached out to, and this is very common where they do a little bit, and so we, you know, we back off, and then, you know, some time goes by, and then it gets bad again, and there's always this back and forth, but we do have, you know, when we do uh, follow our ordinances, um, there are time frames as part of that, you know, we, we give them so many days to respond. We, and when I did a presentation, I think it was back in January, um, you know, talked about how we usually start off with a courtesy notice, a friendly phone call, and, and then it progresses from there, but it, it is time consuming. You're right. And, um, you know, if, if, if there were more resources, for example, that's dedicated to, um, you know, the administrative side of things. And, and I think InterGov, when we get that implemented, will help a little bit because it'll help us track, okay, 20 days has gone by. It's now the 21st day. We're following up on the next step, whereas sometimes that is difficult to do just because of the volume of work to, to always, you know, follow those exact timelines. And same answer for out at Home Depot, near Home Depot? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of that. I don't know if uh, Hippolito or possibly Scott might know if that is one we have addressed. Uh, I, Karen, I, I can address that. I can address the uh, El Amigo. Um, uh, the El Amigo is currently has code enforcement. We've met out there with the property owner. Uh, they are addressing that site and they're also addressing the site next door. Um, where they had a, a lot of garbage and blight, weeds. Uh, so Scott, um, Dennis Castro is addressing both of those sites. Um, it's, it's just one of, of several commercial sites. We also had addressed in the past the, um, uh, what was that? Um, the one on Murray, the restaurant on Murray. Why am I forgetting the name? Chevy's? Uh, 
Chevy's. Yeah. Chevy's was abandoned for a period of time. It got sold. It got bought by a new person. They fenced it up, cleaned up the site. We are working with the property owners at Foster's. So they are going to redevelop that site. Um, one of the recommendations I would make are for these sites that, um, and we are proactive. For example, there was weeds overgrowing on the corner of what is Camino Royal by Best Buy, the Bank of America. They had weeds that were higher than me. And when I saw them, I called code enforcement and said, hey, send them a letter. Let's get these weeds taken care of. So, you know, there, there are cases where we're proactive. There is a lot of cases out there. But when we see these sites, I, I you know, let us know. Uh, you know, we're out there, but let us know and we'll get them on, on the books and we'll make contact with these property owners. And you're right, Council Member Marks, we do care. We care. We live here. We work here. We raise our families here and we care about our community. So, you know, let us know and we'll, we'll put them on there. But um, as Karen stated, we are a, a you know, a reactive type program. It takes a lot of resources to be proactive. There's a lot of reasons why, but let us know. Send us a, a, a email message and or a call, and, and we'll address these specific sites that are of concern. We do pay, pay um, special attention to the gateway areas. Um, there's, you know, we've had some dump sites on Leavesley, and um, we've we've cleaned them up. Um, so let let me know. But on those two specific sites, there we're addressing those already. Um, any other sites, let me know and, and, and we'll put them on the list and, and we'll address them. Okay, council member. And, and for Caltrans, that's the third thing that she mentioned. Um, yeah, is there a system? Because I mean, I know how that went when it came to uh, people staying there, but now if it's left with burn stuff, is, is, that, is that something somebody follows up with with Caltrans or wh where does that stand? I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. With Caltrans, we do have a connection at Caltrans. We let them know they're, they're a big organization. And so they, they receive these complaints and they'll put us on a schedule. Sometimes when it's excessive, it takes sometimes a person like Jimmy to push up and to really get someone at the regional area to put a lot of pressure. But we do have contact with them. We do make contact with them when we have sites that are becoming excessive and so we put pressure on them. Okay, so I, I've been participating in Caltrans calls every other week, Thursday, and I've got them all for District 4 in the room. And I'm about the only mayor that, that's been attending. So um, I can absolutely be pushing towards things. I just need to know what are the things that the city has requested. So maybe um, I'll make a point of checking in with you. Polito, should I check in with you before I get on those calls and see if there's something pending? I would, I would think that you might want to start with Jimmy and Jimmy. I'll start with Jimmy then. Okay. Okay. Because I am, I have started attending those Jimmy from a few months ago and I like them because they're right. They're all right there and they put it on the list. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we'll see. Okay. Council member Armendaris. Thank you, mayor. Um, and thank you to our staff and Hippolito for their, for their great work. Um, and thank you, Karen. Um, I wanted to ask, um, right now our model is, um, you know, is, is based on uh, complaints. If we go with the proactive enforcement model, do we have the amount of staff to support that? Especially given, um, you know, in that area that Hippolito mentioned on, um, on Camino Arroyo, there's, there's weeds on both sides, right? By Jack in the Box too. And, um, I was reading on social media, a lot more complaints about people overwatering, uh, water running off. And I know that as we um, start addressing the issue of, of the drought, um, there's gonna be a lot more complaints about overwatering and water usage. Is that something that code enforcement also enforces? And is that gonna be, you know, just making their workload heavier without sufficient staff? Um, that's my question. Yeah, um, as far as the water, uh, I believe that is our water division that would handle that. It is not code enforcement staff that handle uh, water use issues. And then uh, in terms of just you know, general overall staffing, you know, yes, to, 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 to add to our program, to add a proactive component would, would require additional staffing. You know, our, our two full-time code enforcement officers and the little help and support that Hippolito and others provide, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the best we can with the caseload we have. And so, uh, you know, to the point that, and Andy was making too, and, and I mentioned is, 
you know, to even start a proactive program, it's going to take a lot of time and energy and effort because you really have to define and lay out specific protocols for how you want to handle that. So there would be a lot of upfront time involved uh, in and of itself just to get a proactive program off the ground. And Hippolito, Rebecca and I are trying to get them to pronounce it right. Okay, we're trying. <laughs> If, if I can just address one little thing, yes, uh, Councilmember Armendariz, uh, the weeds at Jack and Box were also addressed at the same time that the weeds across the street on uh, Bank of America were addressed. Mm -hmm. We're out there, we saw the weeds on both sides. We just said, let's let's just hit both of them on this corner. So when we go out there, we'll typically do that type of enforcement where we'll hit, hit that that area. So it's just fair enforcement where you're not, you know, because I sent them out there, it's like let's just get everybody in that corner and then. You don't have that issue about well why do they have weeds and you're coming to talk to us so it's something that we do so i just want you to know that 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 has been addressed i went by there and and the weeds have been knocked down in that area thank you and water is something of course we know about the drought that is coming up right we're going to be addressing um jimmy's already let me know today that we just have to get the enforcement and the penalties and all that stuff worked out we are aware that you know the city of morgan hill has already announced uh what the, how they're changing their their water system, but that came before they've prepared how they're enforcing it, and what the penalties are going to be. So we'd kind of like to have our teeth ready to go when we start telling people what they have to do. Otherwise, there's nothing you can do until you are able to enforce it anyway. So that's next up is, is the drought stuff. Okay, if there aren't any other questions from council, I'm going to go to any public comment. So Christina, is there anyone who would like to speak on code enforcement? Yes, we have two speakers. Bruce McGee, you may speak. Okay, you have three minutes. Honorable City Council, how are you guys doing today? My name is Bruce McGee, uh, purveyor of the Weathered Soul podcast, also of Gilroy. I've been a resident here since 2009. We have also uh, seen the blight that is in the downtown area, also over there at their uh, Home Depot with the El Amigos. And I think we really need to look at some of the city ordinances we have uh, about uh, the uh, the retrofitting that you have going on downtown for, and, and a lot of the shop, uh, 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 what do you call those, uh, the shop store fronts and, and all the issues that have to do with all these blighted uh, 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 properties that we have here. And also, um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the trash that that gets that gets uh, dumped all over the place. I know it's a, it's a hard issue that we have to deal with because of the homeless problem and just the irresponsible of other people that come into our town and dump. But uh, also, I just want to just make a, a consideration also about the taxes that we pay or not the taxes, but, we, but the permit fees that homeowners have to pay to do certain things in their in their homes to be able to renovate and things like that. And I know most of us are compliant, but we should look at uh, at the cost that it takes to do these permitting uh, things. And uh, that's kind of just really what I wanted to say. I just wanted to get it out there that uh, we are all aware of the blight that's going around. It really does not look good for Gilroy, especially, you know, I've been going past El Amigo because I, you know, constantly go to Home Depot all the time. And it's something that that just can, it's a perpetual looks like it just keeps going downhill, no matter how much code enforcement is involved. So that's really all I want to say. And uh, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Next speaker, we have Maria Aguilar. Hi there. Uh, I just wondered, I know that Orchard Supply, that building's been sitting there empty for years. Every once in a while, they rent it out, but then again, it goes back and it's just sitting there. To me, that's quite an eyesore. I think a few months ago, you talked about having some kind of parking in the front. Is that what I understood was going to happen to that site? Uh, go ahead, Ipolito, go ahead. Um, um, I'll just speak on that. Orchard Supply Center is currently being leased out to what was Gilroy Motorcycle. They were located downtown. Currently, there's construction going on. Plans have been submitted. so. Uh, I, I agree that Orchard Center was looking really bad for years and years, but they have a tenant that will be moving in. 
shortly. They have plans in place. They're currently doing construction and we will get another vacant building downtown that could be used for repurposed. But uh, the Orchard Center will have a, a, a long, nice long-term tenant going in there. So uh, they're currently going through rehab. So hopefully we'll get rid of that building. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. the information. All right, thank you. Any others, Christina? We have none. All right, then closing uh, public comments and uh, back to council. This is just received report, um, unless there's uh, some specific direction that uh, council would like to provide, we will move on. Okay, thank you all very much. Very, very, very informative. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Okay, um, item 10. So introduction of new business. This is fireworks enforcement strategy. And uh, Captain Jason Smith is going to give us this report uh, before we go on to more specifics. So uh, Jason, please go at it. And Mayor. then you, sorry. Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd like to do a really quick intro uh, before we get to Captain Smith, if that, Very good. that's okay. Of course. Uh, I, I do want to, uh, tell the community and council that this is um, an issue that is also in its own life cycle. It, it, it does occur every year and we certainly understand how frustrating it is for people. Uh, I, I talk to city managers in other cities. It is a very, very common issue and, and, and one that is, not, is very short of solutions. And I tell you that to be honest and to be transparent because if you can imagine any, any crime of what level you have, uh, when you have hundreds of them a night uh, of explosives and, and illegal activity when it comes to fireworks, it is extremely difficult to, uh, to make an impact on that kind of activity. Um, I know that our police department is committed to providing the safest community they can, but I, unfortunately at times when you receive 100 calls in a day, uh, you have to place those in hierarchy of you know, health and safety, uh, life uh, type of um, in enforcement or activities. So I, I say that so that uh, I hope that the community can be somewhat sympathetic to that challenge that we have. It's not that we don't want to do anything about it. It's just that it is very difficult to uh, to uh, to have a solution to. And I'm, I'm thankful that Captain Smith will be able to take you through what we are doing and what we can do, but also with the caveat that it is very difficult uh, to uh, to enforce a fire code violation or a fireworks violations. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Captain Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Um, again, my name is Jason Smith. I'm a captain with the Gilroy Police Department, and uh, I currently oversee our Special Operations Division. And uh, I just want to start off today by just briefly going over what we've done for the last few years in regards to education, enforcement, and reporting of illegal fireworks violations, because many of these strategies we're going to use again. Um, but I also want to talk about some of the additional strategies we're planning to use this year. So we'll start off with education. So this year, like any year, we've started with an education campaign uh, using our social media platforms. And this is really a coordinated effort with uh, city departments to educate the public, not only about the dangers of fireworks, but the punishments associated with their possession and or use. Um, through this campaign, we let the public know that the Gilroy Police Department has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to illegal fireworks. We'll talk about it enforcement. So in addition to our patrol staff who are already working uh, on the 4th of July, we deploy an extra 12 officers to work 4th of July night uh, to work specifically the illegal firework enforcement detail. And the majority of these officers are on their day off, but uh, they come in to spend their holiday with us and uh, with the goal of keeping the community safe and, and holding uh, people that choose to light illegal fireworks accountable. Uh, these extra officers are funded through uh, mitigation fees from legal firework sales in town. So this year and, and for the last several years, we've had our uh, anti-crime team take the lead and coordinate all our firework enforcement efforts. Um, and this year, the sergeant that is uh, with that team, this will be his fifth year. So we have a lot of experience at the helm. I want to talk about reporting. Um, so of course, if it's a life-threatening emergency and immediate response is needed, uh, we always will tell people to call 911. But if it's not an emergency, um, 
and you need an officer to respond, uh, people are welcome to call our non-emergency uh, line, um, which is 408-846-0350. But we also have some alternative ways to report fireworks. Uh, last year, we created an email called uh, fireworks at uh, cityofgilroy.org. And really a good way to, to look at this, it's essentially an email tip line um, that, that um, really gives the community members the, the ability to provide uh, information about illegal fireworks to include photos or video evidence. Um, the information that they provide can be used uh, as investigative intelligence, uh, cooperate other complaints, and ultimately could help lead to a filing of a criminal case. Uh, the more information that we receive, the better, but we never, ever, ever want our community members to place themselves at, in harm's way or at or risk. So all we ask is um, for uh, community members just to provide the information they feel comfortable providing, and that includes their personal information. So this email is actively monitored in the weeks leading up uh, to the 4th of July holiday and for a short time after. We do monitor it throughout the year. Uh, but it's only on a periodic basis. Uh, we also have the application, the NALEM application. This will be our third year of using that application. And um, NALEM is a smartphone application. It's a free service provided by TNT Fireworks. And it allows for real-time instant communication with our officers that are assigned to work the illegal firework enforcement detail. And the app is only active on the 4th of July from 7 p.m. to midnight. So people can still report illegal fireworks by calling our dispatch center, uh, but the application is really the preferred method uh, for 4th of July uh, between 7 and midnight. And as you can imagine, um, our dispatch center just gets inundated with calls for service. And um, this application not only gives real-time information to the officers in the field, but helps alleviate some of the call volume that our dispatch center gets. So um, I wanna talk about some of the new strategies for 2021. And uh, one thing we wanna do is we really wanna focus on criminal citations for firework violations. Before the emphasis was on administrative sites, um, but we've had some, some talks with our DA's office. And one of the fears we always have is if we put the work in, are people really gonna be held accountable? And given the inherent dangers of illegal fireworks, our DA's office has committed to filing criminal charges uh, for cases they feel they can prove. Uh, they, can, they have evidence be, beyond a reasonable doubt that if it did go to trial, they would have enough evidence to convict. Um, just so all of you know, most firework violations, if not all, are misdemeanor violations. Uh, punishments can include fine, public service, probation, and in, in very rare cases, a jail time. Another thing about criminal citations is if somebody doesn't follow through with um, something that's required of them, whether that's going to a court date or if that is uh, paying a fine, the court can issue a warrant for the arrest. So it's just a, another level of accountability. In these criminal cases, they, they definitely take more work and time, but we really feel like it's at this point, it's the best option for holding um, the individuals that make this choice to use illegal fireworks responsible for their actions. So another thing we're doing this year is, is we really want high visibility um, and we wanna deter people from making that choice. In years past, we've um, deployed an, uh, an overwhelming amount of undercover cars, undercover officers, which can be effective, but um, we feel that um, using marked patrol cars and officers in full uniform, um, it just shows more of a police presence. I think it's gonna make our community um, feel more safe because we did have a, a bigger presence the last couple of years, but you wouldn't know because we're undercover. And uh, another thing it gives us the ability to do is, is really engage with the public because when we're, we are undercover, you blow your cover if you come out. So. Um, this way, if we're in marked patrol cars, marked uniform, uh, not only are we, we deterring, uh, we get to wave high to the uh, different block parties and engage our citizens. So it's, it's um, a good strategy. And lastly, something we haven't done before um, is our drone, deploy drones for 4th of July. This is a new program. 
Um, and as time and staffing allows, uh, especially leading up to the 4th of July, we're planning to de deploy our drone to um, possibly help locate offenders and their locations, and uh, maybe even obtain video evidence of illegal firework possession and use. And um, the more research that we've done, we see other jurisdictions are, are taking the same um, taking the same strategy. And really on the non-criminal side, we can use the, the drone to help monitor places open to the public to look for fire hazards. Um, and then lastly, uh, I, wanna, I wanna end with this. Um, the police department understands that uh, this is a very important issue for the community for a number of valid reasons. And I, I think we all understand that the enforcement of illegal firework violations can be challenging to say the least. Um, we just can't be everywhere all the time. And, and just like any call we receive, we have to prioritize our, response, our responses accordingly. Um, but it's also important to let all of you know that we're committed to doing uh, our best to keep both our officers and our community safe uh, during this 4th of July holiday. And we really hope that um, everybody can enjoy their Independence Day uh, with their family and, and in peace. So that's all I have. Thank you, Captain. I think um, before I go to the rest of the council, I'd like to ask you some questions that I gave you in advance so the public can hear these answers. It'll just add, I think, some more specifics to the report you just gave before we go into public comment so that maybe people don't have to ask something that we're, we're about to answer right now. And the, the first is, what is the maximum? I mean, you said it's a misdemeanor. So no matter how you slice it, whatever kind of bombish sort of thing they're they're shooting off it's still a misdemeanor right Correct. okay Correct. so what is the maximum fine that we have jurisdiction to impose or is it not even in our jurisdiction is that something the da's office or the state of california sets as a misdemeanor uh, if it's a misdemeanor that we send to criminal court it's up to the da's office and a misdemeanor is punishable by up to a year in county jail or a thousand dollar fine Okay, so there's nothing the city council can do to increase the the uh, the penalties. Not for a criminal uh, case. For administrative mm -hmm. case, that the, the city has the authority to, um, if we went uh, the administrative citation route, the council has the uh, or the city has the ability to adjust their fines, and we just did that a couple of years ago, up to a thousand dollars. Right. So you mean the city could make an administrative fine of $5,000 if we wanted to? Um, I'll leave that uh, question up to Andy. Okay, Andy, uh, could you address that? Because the public is seems to have an impression that we can just, you know, uh, put some very large fine on it and that's somehow going to help. Yeah, we'd have to look at that because we went through quite a lot of analysis when we raised the fines a while ago. They had been like $100 for the first violation and so on. And in fact, I think we can raise the fines. The problem with the administrative process, though, it is not as well defined in the sense as the court process, and it's subject to delays. And so it's, it's a trade-off, and we, we don't have the unrestricted ability to just have huge fines and then have a simple process that imposes them. You can't sort of have it both ways, I think. Right. You want, in other words, you're, you're saying you'd rather have the criminal prosecution, but but you can't have that with fines higher than what the DA's office will impose. Right. Yeah, that, that's okay. correct. But, but okay. then you get the advantage of having the DA's plus it's a more formal uh, kind of process, which you know can be beneficial in this context. Yeah, and I would think a little more uh, uh, scary, if you will. Yeah, to scary the, is the word I was looking for, I think. Yeah, yeah to the person. That's what we want, right? We're trying to deter. So that is what we would want. And um, can you also confirm, whether it's Andy or Jason, that we do impose fines, we whether it's through administratively or through criminal, on the property owner if the if the perpetrator has the permission of the property owner to be present on that property, either as a tenant or a guest of the property owner, right? We can also punish the property owner as long as this isn't a trespassing issue. Is that correct? Yes, that is. And I think we, my recollection is we modified our ordinance a few years ago. Yes, that. that is exactly my, mine too. So I just want maybe some people newer to Gilroy or people who haven't really been, uh, you know, so fiercely wanting to get into this issue, maybe don't realize that those fines are already there as long as it's not somebody trespassing because you can't find a property owner who didn't know 
that somebody just went over to their backyard and shot off a, or, or whatever they did. Okay, when residents report fireworks violations, um, when they do it year round, either using 8460350 or whether it's um, fireworks at cityofgilray.org, if they have the information, the minimum information, like, you know, um, if they know who did it, or at least the general location, or what kind of fireworks, if, if they're able to provide some of this minimum information, how do, how does the, how do the police, what do the police do with that information? And throughout the year, how often do we actually nail anybody that way? Well, it's, every case is different. The more information we have, the more we have to work with. Unfortunately, right. firework calls are a lot of uh, herd only. We think it came from this area. Um, we think it came from this house. It's just difficult. So right. um, the more information we have to work with, the more we can build a, a criminal case. The criminal cases are just very, very difficult to prove. Um, Fourth of July, we have 12 extra bodies out enforcing specifically firework related offenses. Um, so our stats are, are, are gonna be uh, normally higher uh, than they would be throughout the year. Um, but it, it, it really, we have to look at workload. Um, yeah, no, I understand. Misdemeanor violation. Um, mm -hmm. if, if somebody wants, uh, because it's a misdemeanor, uh, we'd have to have a citizen press charges if we didn't see it ourselves. So they would have to make a citizen's arrest. Right. Um, and what, what would it take to make it not a misdemeanor? Who has the authority for that to make it something more than a misdemeanor? Uh, that would be the legislature, I believe. Okay, okay, again, so that, right. I'm just trying to point these, these things out. So city council only has so much that they could do. And with regard to um, safe and sane fireworks, it's the fees that we get from allowing those that pay for the additional 12 officers. Correct, right? on, additional, on the, this, yes. On the 4th of July night. So in your opinion, is there anything about having the safe and sane fireworks um, that would, that that takes away. In other words, would it be easier to see the illegal ones if the safe and sane ones weren't out there? If if no fireworks were allowed at all, would it would it somehow give the police more resources to do something with the illegal, or would it not make a difference because you wouldn't then have the money for the twelve additional officers? Well, we wouldn't have the money, but um, you know, in my opinion, it's really it's really not the safe and sane fireworks that are the issue. It's the illegal fireworks that are the issue. Right, no, I'm, I'm aware. Uh, again, it's just um, people seem to think that uh, the safe and sane ones are, are what about fire? Uh, safe and sane ones, are they at all a fire hazard? But they can be, but um, you know, if you use them properly, then uh, they're, they're, they're pretty safe. I know, um, I know. I'm trying you know, to get the, at the these. One thing about fireworks is, as far as having legal fireworks, and I, I, I don't want to get too deep in that debate, but um, it does give people a legal avenue to use fireworks right. where other communities don't have that. So it almost makes it more inexcusable to use them here in Gilroy when you do have a legal option, which of most, a lot of communities do not. Yes, except they are st even safe and sane are illegal in many parts of the city. It just depends on where, right, where you're, you're using them. Okay, I do want the public to know that we are doing a fireworks show at Gilroy High School. Too. So that that is going to happen. That notification will get out. So in case anybody's disappointed with whatever happens here tonight, they'll know that. Okay, I'll go to council. Council member Armandaris, do you have a question? Hi, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Captain Smith. I um, have a few questions. Um, the nail um app and the email uh, reporting. How come those aren't active for the rest of the year? So the nail um app is just it's given to us by TNT Fireworks. Um, so they let us use their software um, and their interface uh, just during 4th of July. Um, as far as monitoring the email uh, throughout the year, we, we do periodically, but um, fireworks are mainly a problem during um, 4th of July and, and during, uh, let's say, New Year's Eve. So it does happen all throughout the year. I read the posts. Um, I live in a town where I hear fireworks periodically. I, I completely understand that. It's just, it, it really comes down to, um, you know, our, our ability to um, monitor, you know, monitor, to daily monitor that email would just take a lot of staff time. Maybe my, my side of town is particularly patriotic, but I hear uh, fireworks year round. 
year round. And there's um, a lot of empty fields, a lot of dry grass around here. So that's why, um, you know, it is a, a concern for me. Um, and, you know, I know you guys uh, monitor social media, so you see what a big issue it is around town. Um, let's see, my other question is about um, drone use. So our current drone use policy would prohibit, um, except in the case of an emergency, right? The videotaping or with a warrant. So I'm wondering, um, to what extent can we use the drones for uh, to monitor fireworks? Well, this will be our first year even, even trying that. And uh, the goal is not to uh, spy on backyard parties. The, the goal is to look for people that are um, using illegal fireworks and, and doing it in a dangerous way and bringing um, our attention to them. Um, and in so- the In a public place, right? Not where, not somewhere where they would can expect privacy, right? But if they're doing Correct. it in the street in a public area. Okay, Correct. thank you. And then last question, um, what kind of uh, work is being done to address the flow of these fireworks into our community? So I remember back in the day, people would travel out of town across the state lines to go get them, but I know that they're more readily available. Um, and like what kind of work is being done regionally or, or locally? to uh, figure out where so many fireworks are coming into our community. Well, Council Member Armendariz, the pipelines you spoke of are, are still in, in um, effect today. So people are going to different states, they're going um, across borders, um, and they're going to places that um, you know are known for uh, fireworks. So um, a lot of people will go up to San Francisco. That's another hot spot with the ports. Um, so I think that's really being looked at on a federal and state level. Um, municipalities like ourselves, we uh, do our best, but um, it's really such a big problem that, um, you know, it's more suited in the state or federal realm. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, oh, I thought I had saw hands up, but nobody, hands went down. My question was answered already. Okay. Same here. Okay, great. Well, then I'm going to go to public comment then if no one else on uh, Chief oh. Wyatt, did you want to say something? Are you going to deploy uh, fire uh, personnel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're definitely planning on that uh, using the, uh, uh, the uh, mitigation fee, but I'll, I'll just add uh, uh, Captain Smith's um, presentation was was excellent and I, and I totally agree with everything that he says. And the fire department definitely wants to partner with, uh, uh, with PD on uh, the enforcement uh, uh, of the fireworks, the illegal fireworks. But I wanted to say that um, he, it was brought up about um, uh, the number of fires that we had just last year. And I'll just use 4th of July uh, of 2020. We had nine fires two of which resulted in structure fires. Uh, somebody uh, burned off part of their roof as a result of an illegal bottle rocket landing in there. And somebody lost their shed and part of their fence line as a result of another bottle rocket uh, being lobbed into their, uh, into their uh, farmland. So, uh, and the rest of the other fires, the seven were, were vegetation fires. So uh, every single one that we investigated, they were all illegal fireworks, not one safe and sane. Um, and I'll just say also that the injuries that we encounter are significant. Um, uh, they happen throughout the year. We actually lost, uh, so one of the uh, residents here lost a thumb as a result of, a, of an M80 going off much sooner than he anticipated. Uh, injuries to children are, are definitely on the increase as well. So uh, they aren't without you know, they're, they're obviously a nuisance to us when they, when they go boom and uh, at all hours of the night, but they also cause a tremendous amount of uh, damage uh, physically. And I just want to remind people that the, um, the unsafe, the illegal fireworks are the ones that are the biggest problem to us. They're the ones that cause our fires and they're ones that cause uh, everyone grief at night when they're exploding uh, or, uh, or landing on people's roofs and causing fires. So anyway, that's just what I wanted to say, uh, Madam thank Mayor, you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, Madam, going- Madam Mayor, oh, I have one absolutely. quick question if I, if sure. I might. Of course. Uh, 
So, Captain, you know, thank you for the uh, the presentation. I, I think you you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the difficulties in terms of how we allocate scarce resources and how it's you 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 can only you can only be in so many places at one time, unfortunately, and that's just kind of the reality we all face. And you also spoke to the importance of the connection with the DA's office because. You can have all the citations or arrests that you want in the world, but without an actual prosecution that follows, you know, there's no penalty imposed. Uh, but my question, I, I might have missed this in your presentation, it was about the levels of incidences of, of the illegal fireworks or the fireworks just in general. I, I think for me, I'm just getting my own sense that it's it seems like we have more and more of them, but do we have stats that kind of back that up? Because we, we hear more and more from our, our residents about it. I just want to see if what, how the trend lines are going, if we have that information. You know, I don't, I don't have the stats, but I will agree with you. It, it just seems like there's more. It just seems like there's more fireworks. And I, I live um, in San Benito County, and it seems like it's more there, too. Um, so I unfortunately don't have any stats to back it up. But just the general feeling is, yes, it's, it seems like it's more. And just to go to go with that, I mean, we we've instituted the the app. We've got you know we're going to try the drone now and all this kind of stuff. It seems whatever we do, regardless, the number just keeps going up and up and up. So it just it's something that we need to think about. I don't have an answer tonight, but it's just something that we think about how we can um, make make more efficient use or wiser use of our resources to try to tackle this thing. Anyway, thank you, Captain. Appreciate thank the you. Okay, I would like to go to the public now, Council Member Armanderis. I know you've had a chance. Okay, because they're waiting. Thank you, and then we'll come back to Council. Okay, so Christina, do you um, do you have like a visual on how many people are there are, are wanting to speak? Uh, yes, we have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so with five people, I've asked Christina to give the, the regular three minutes. And more than that, I was gonna cut it down to two and then you know, more than that one. So um, we'll try it at five and, and hope that uh, three minutes gives everybody a chance to say what they want. Please remember, there's no need to repeat what someone else has said. You can just agree with the previous uh, person unless you have something new to say. So, all right, go Mary, ahead. Mary, actually, uh, it went up to nine. So do you wanna do- oh, let's, Yeah, let's do two minutes. Okay. Each, and then if it goes up more than 10, then we're gonna go down to one. Okay, so we'll start off with uh, Susan. Give me one second to reshare, oh. re reset the timer to two minutes. Okay. okay. Ready. All right. Okay. Ready. All right. Go ahead, Susan. Okay. I'm here. Yes. Um, Mayor, city council members, and thank you, Captain Smith. I am a resident of Gilroy and represent a group of citizens from 34 neighborhoods in Gilroy. As much as you've done regarding illegal fireworks, we feel that more can be done year round. There is a zero tolerance of illegal fireworks in Gilroy. However, most of us believe that there should be a zero tolerance for fireworks of any kind. Gilroy should only allow controlled exhibitions on July 4th at venues such as Gilroy High School. The use of fireworks by anyone other than a professional pyrotechnician is dangerous and potentially deadly. Illegal fireworks were responsible for nine fires in July 2020, two of which damaged or destroyed buildings. We believe that penalties should be stricter, fines should be substantial and increased for repeat offenders. We also believe that there should be a mandatory jail sentence. California law states that possession of large quantities can be charged as a felony. Punishment for a felony fireworks violation can include up to three years in the California state prison and fines as high as $50,000. We would like to see the reporting app enabled year round rather than the five hours that is on July 4th. This would encourage citizens to report illegal fireworks without fear of retaliation. 
For combat veterans, especially those dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, these explosions are particularly difficult to deal with. Those with non-combat PTSD are also profoundly affected. Those with have autism, the unexpected and violent nature of any type of fireworks can cause anxiety and stress, and fireworks can be extremely distressing to them. I see I'm running out of time, so I can't say anything more, but thank you for speaking, and I know this is only the beginning. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Next speaker, we have Anadori Kushner. You may speak. Yes, hi. Thanks for um, uh, allowing comments. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with Susan. I'm, I'm part of that citizen group. We're up to over 100 people um, representing all the various neighborhoods. And um, while Captain Smith was addressing all the, the mitigation efforts on July 4th, I, I feel that there's a little bit of a disconnect because um, the citizenry here in Gilroy, we're feeling like we're under attack. It's like a war zone. And while the, the word fireworks, it's sort of, oh, party time, you know, holiday, la, la, la. What's going on here nightly almost is uh, explosions going off where you literally, the house is shaking. So it's, it's kind of fireworks is almost a diminutive uh, of a term because um, this is more like warlike conditions. And, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what the motivations are because from my understanding is these uh, heavy duty uh, M80s and, and up are very expensive. So I'm inclined to think they're not just juvenile punks uh, just from, the, from a cost perspective. But speaking of costs, that nail them app sounds awesome. If we could have that all year round, maybe the council could look into what is required for us to maybe purchase it or lease it or something to that effect. Because if all the residents could be reporting on an ongoing basis, uh, it would help uh, collect data. Is it the same locations? Uh, establish the number of incidents, which will then of course help us determine whether the fines um, need to go up and what needs to be done because uh, without metrics, without numbers, it, this is all sort of a very um, loose conversation. Anecdotally, I just know that this, this is several times a week, usually in the evening hours, and it's quite disconcerting because the, the booms, it's like somebody just blew a bomb off a uh, street over. So, uh, and I think uh, you, you will see the citizenry get up uh, much more involved in this subject. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker, we have um, Isaac. You may speak. Uh, my name is Makan Gupta. And uh, uh, first of all, thank you for all those things you guys are doing. It is a great idea to doing uh, jail time, fine time and all that. But same token, by, by handling all the crime with a heavy hand may, may not be a solution. I believe we need to figure out how to somehow or other positively enforce education, teaching, and guiding the adults and children throughout the year. So they themselves do not want to use the fireworks. All the fireworks has to be purchased by adult. Children don't just buy them because they don't have the capability or the money. So along with everything you guys are doing, please look at a way by educating and positive uh, enforcement uh, to the city people in the city of Gilroy. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. We have Jay, you may speak. Oh, hi, yeah, just have a question for Captain Smith. Uh, we know that you guys are short staffed uh, fireworks are going off as I speak. Um, we know that you're all short staff. I had just had a question. Um, you know, it's kind of rumored that people are going around in their cars, lighting them off in their cars and driving away throughout neighborhoods. I'm just wondering is, you know, most people, well, a lot of people have security cameras on their house and take cell phone videos. Is, would that constitute enough if you received a video of, you know, a car or a certain house lighting off illegal fireworks. Is that enough for you to do enforcement? And do you have staff to do and, you know, look, review these videos and do something about it? That's all I have. Okay, Jay, we'll have that question answered for you after we get done with public comment. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, so um, Captain, Captain Smith, please make note of that. All right, next speaker. Bruce McGee, you may speak. Yes, thank you, Council. Um, I'm all for the education, just like Isaac said, but uh, prohibition has never led to a solution in any type of, of thing that we're going on. We got the war on drugs, war on terror, blah, blah, blah. However, the situation is, is that the community needs to be more involved with the enforcement instead of the law enforcement or the, or the resources that the city can provide only because of the fact that they are the ones that are, that are next door or watching the cars drive away or whatever the situation may be. I just believe that if uh, people would speak up more, because I know that there's a lot of people out there that, that uh, need to speak up, and they know that these things are going on in, in our neighborhood. Uh, I do realize that this is a problem. I hear it every night myself. And that, uh, but I'm not for increasing fines or increasing jail time or anything like that. I think it's a community problem that the community needs to enforce. And I think education is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next, we have Maria. You may speak. Yes, I moved here from Oregon in uh, July 2019. I lived on Monterey and Lewis, and I would call the non-emergency police number. And I had an officer tell me once that if I didn't like the noise, I could move. I moved to Kern and First behind Taco Bell. And for the past couple of months, I've been hearing the fireworks. My lease expires in December, and one of the reasons I'm going to be moving again is because of the fireworks. I've been hearing about this problem going on for five plus years, and I haven't seen or heard anything that's been going on by posts or comments on next door. I'd just like to know, um, I'm going to be moving, I'm missing my 18-month-old grandson growing up here in Gilroy because it doesn't seem like anybody's taking this problem Seriously, also safe and sane. I agree with one of the comments that if you allow that, then you can allow the legal fireworks. I would just like to know, I live in an apartment complex. I'm also disabled and I'm 60 years old. I'm not gonna try and go out and find the illegal fireworks. When I was downtown Gilroy, I saw the fireworks going off but I couldn't identify what area it was coming from because I was new to Gilroy. Those are just some of my comments. I'm just serious, I'm just wondering how serious the city council, the police department, or fire department is to the people that have to live here and daily, nightly, month prior, prior to the fourth going off, they hear the fireworks and then months afterwards fireworks. And it just seems like an unending problem. Now that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, caller. We do all live here too, just so you know. <laughs> okay, next speaker. We have Peter Salazar, you may speak. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Peter Salazar and I have lived for 14 years in the Forest Park area. If, uh, if I could borrow the drone from the city, I'd be happy to fly and help you track down the, where those things are launched. At 9.23 p.m. last night, an airborne firework went off. The resulting flash lit up the face of our home and the explosion was so loud, our house shook. At 9.25 p.m., there were more explosions around our home. And these continued in the area for about an hour. While the launch of such products is officially illegal, incidents such as this occur frequently throughout Gilroy. Why? What penalty exists to discourage such activity? And who's listening? Years ago, not in Gilroy, I personally was struck in my left arm by an unexplored ordinance while sitting in the midst of a public 4th of July event. Accidents happen, we know that. Given the hundreds of illegal airborne fireworks in Gilroy, when will the next accident happen here? What action will this city council take to prevent the next incident? Or do we again need to wait for our city to tragically fall upon national news? before we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. We have Danielle. You may speak. Hi, um, my name is Danielle Urbanitas and I lived in um, Gilroy for three and a half years in Glen Loma Ranch 
And um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you um, for, for um, educating us, um, the Captain Smith, Fire Chief Wyatt, and um, Council Members and Madam Mayor for sharing all the information about what is being done and, and what's changed um, from prior years. Um, I'd be very excited to see some improvement being made through these um, methods. I also wanted to add though that I've lived in dozens of cities in three countries and I have never experienced anything like what I go through living in Gilroy, hearing these um, mortars go off on a regular basis. And that's why a lot of us are not um, enthused about, I mean, from a fire prevention standpoint, yes, the emphasis on 4th of July is great, but we're dealing with this, these noises, um, these you know, massive explosions uh, all year round. And I think that is where a lot of us would like to see some effort, uh, more effort being made and more effective effort being made. Um, one one uh, poster on Nextdoor suggested maybe there could be some kind of rewards for people um, for reporting those who are doing illegal fireworks. Uh, they had seen it work in another city. So I know there are other things that can be considered that um, we haven't discussed here tonight. Um, thanks for your for listening and um, look forward to doing whatever we can to help with this problem. Thank you. Next speaker. It's our um, last public comment. Karen Fortino, you may speak. Good evening. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak. Council, I'd like to thank you as well. I just wanted to share a quick experience that I had with the uh, Gilroy non-emergency line because I too am, am going through what you all are going through on this nightly basis. Literally um, last night, 8.18, 8.30, 9.15 and 9.37 over in the vicinity where I live. Uh, a couple of months back, I did call the non-emergency line with a pretty exact location going over the bridge on Luchessa gave that to the 911 opera or the non-emergency line operator. And he basically told me to go out there myself and to um, take pictures of, of these you know, young men that were hanging out. And then um, when I told him, I thought that was a ridiculous response as I'm not in law enforcement. He basically um, said, well, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. And I was hung up on. So we're trying to do what we can to, to preserve the city of Gilroy. I've lived here in the you know, Gilroy area all of my life, as does my family. And um, I just thought that that should be expressed to you guys that, that that's how one citizen was treated. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, did you say that was the last one, Christina? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so back to council. I've got some comments myself, but Rebecca, council member Armanderis has been waiting. So why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank all the, the residents who, who called in and who are really taking a, a, a sincere and genuine interest and, in, you know, I want to put forth the, the work and the energy that it takes to, to come to some creative solutions, right, um, as a community, as a community. I'm wondering what it would take for our um, city and our county um, to create a, like a regional task force, something where the sheriff's office is putting out um, resources and other communities, um, something Bay Area wide so that we can address the, this flow of uh, fireworks um, as a region, right? Cause just like so many other things, um, the flow of illegal fireworks into our community is a, is a regional problem as we see it from all of our communities around us. Um, I, I'm really at a loss for, um, for solutions besides what our, our officers are already doing is I, you know, I think that, that if we can get the sheriff's office and other cities, uh, police departments to, to buy into this, we can address it, um, and try to stem the flow of, of these illegal, um, explosives coming into our community. All right. Thank you. So I'd like to go to uh, Captain, S Captain Smith. I, I have a couple questions myself, but can you first answer the caller Jay's question that I said would be answered when we finished with public comment? Did you uh, make note of that? 
I did. And essentially, the question was, if somebody has some information about a violation, in this case, he used the uh, video evidence, um, is there anything we can do about that? And do we have the time to do it? So the, uh, the answer would be, anytime you have information about a crime, absolutely report it. And if there's something we can do about it, we, we will do it. Um, as far as staff time, uh, obviously things get prioritized, but uh, we understand that fireworks is an important issue. So um, as time allows, we will uh, investigate it if it's something that we can. Yeah, yeah, I would think it's a matter of what exactly does the video show, right? If it can, if you can identify a person with the video or identify a license plate number or something, that's something you can do something with. If it doesn't really show you anything identifying, it, it might be tougher. I was wondering if from the money that we get from the fees for the safe and sane fireworks, the, the same money that we use to, to fund the additional 12 officers on the 4th of July, is there enough money there or going forward, you know, starting next year, for example, could we, could, could there be enough money for some kind of reward program? Not, not so much, it would be, to me, there's two, twofold benefit there. One, of course, it gives people maybe a little more motivation to report somebody for, for those. I mean, the callers that called in tonight, they're gonna report. If they've got information they've seen, you know they're gonna report. But there are a lot of people out there that don't. You know, they, they, they don't, and that's a big part of the problem. So this would help motivate some to report more. And knowing that there's a reward system, it might make the perpetrators think, oh, people have motivation now to report. So even if the reward is something small, and I don't know what other cities are, that was one of the questions I, I had asked you earlier, and I, I didn't share that with the public before, but is there, is there something to look at there? Ha, has that worked in other places, and is that something we could do? Well, as far as the money, I'll, I'll let um, City Administrator Forbes talk about that, um, because I'm not sure. I think, I think on average we get 40000 I believe, but I don't, I don't want to misquote. And it's going to depend on how many fireworks are sold in the inventory. Of course. Um, so as far as rewards, um, one city that I know is doing it this year is Seaside. That's probably the closest city that I was able to identify. And they do a $50 reward. Um, and that means the person needs to report it. Uh, it's got to result in a citation and the person's got to be willing to go to court if it, the case goes to court. So they have to be willing to prosecute. So they have those three, uh, a three pronged approach to that, to that reward. And then I looked and other cities are offering $2,500. Um, and so there's, there's a pretty wide range, but um, Seaside would be the closest city. So it's, who, I, I can't tell you how much of a difference it would make. Um, I, I suppose it might make a difference in, um, you know, but to, to measure that would be uh, right. So none of those success of seaside. None of those cities then have used them with enough history for you to know if it's what it's done, what it's produced. Correct. And of course, the reward is if it leads to some kind of prosecution. It's not reward for just saying something, right? It's the reward is if it leads to apprehending somebody. Yeah, that's that's my understanding. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, Jimmy, is that something that we could consider? Well, I, I actually, I think there's a lot of things on the table. Um, you know, our ordinance was mentioned, um, regional efforts was mentioned. Um, I think there's a lot of things here that we, we can work on. Uh, I think between now and the, this current 4th of July, we just don't have enough time to put those no. things in place. Right, but I but think getting ready for the next cycle of New Year's and for the next 4th of July, uh, is certainly something we can start working with council on just trying to do anything. As the captain said, uh, the city of Richmond is doing $2,500 and others are doing 50. I, I, I don't know how effective it would be, but we're, we should try something and, and see where we go. Yeah, I think that's where we're going. And it's not that, I mean, honestly, I don't think that this is just a 4th of July problem either. I mean, I know they're out there year round and they do seem to be getting worse. And it has to be that they're just, uh, they're coming in and how we stop them from coming in, how you get the source. I think it is gonna be state, federal, some other level, but you know, what, trying to get at what we can do here um, in the meantime. Okay, uh, council member Armandaris, you have another comment? Um, I feel like our officers, it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole, right? They get a report here, they go after that one, then they get another one and they're just, um, 
like that all night. Like I've seen them racing around town that way. And I'm wondering, is there a is there any task force statewide or countywide that's that's addressing illegal fireworks? Was there one that you know of, or maybe the chief could chime in? Um, not that I know of. I mean, every every city and or most communities are having the same issue. And I don't know if it's on the, the same level as Gilroy, but um, I know the city I live in, it's, I, I'm gonna say it's very comparable. Um, but as far as like a regional approach, um, that, that's gonna be hard, except like you had mentioned earlier about stopping the influx of the, the fireworks. I can see that being more regional approach, but dealing with calls as they come out, um, you know, getting to the call and then them stopping and then going to the next that 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 would be difficult to put a task force together for that but but definitely trying to stop the supply chain i could i could potentially see that yeah no i meant like the way that it has to be enforced right now it's like whack-a-mole right yeah yeah versus you know you have to go after individuals versus going after the supply chain or you know the flow i think would be worth the efforts yeah <sighs> All right, any other comments from council? Um, I don't know, Jimmy, do you feel like this is something to uh, to bring, you know, to bring back from your perspective and I don't know, a few months out or, or something that could help or do you just wanna look at this in terms of that, like you said, the next cycle? Well, I'm, I'm hearing from council that they, they don't agree that it is a cycle. They, they, they believe from what they're seeing in their community that it's, it's ongoing. So I think it, it, it's important for us to address that then. And I can certainly uh, put this as part of our future uh, work uh, to start working at these things. It, I will be honest, you know, as we talk about priorities, it's not the highest priority, but it is a priority. And it's something we can do some things to try to see uh, what we can do better. So I certainly would be committed to that if that's the council direction. Yeah, and it'd be really nice to see what, what has happened in these other cities that have done these rewards. If we get some feedback and if you find out after 4th of July or you know into the end of July, what did it do in their cities? Did they see any difference? Did they see any improvement that could help us determine going forward? Okay, council member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and just sort of stay on that question. Uh, Jimmy, in regards to, you know, again, um, It'll be good to see how these other cities do. They have these rewards in place. Um, if we decide later on and we see it's successful and we decide to go that route, where would the funding come from? You, you know, some communities have utilized nonprofits. Right. Others have utilized their own funds. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Okay. So, I mean, there's- uh, Because change. this can also, also follow under the auspices of fire prevention. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all. That was, uh, thanks everybody for their time, the public for their time, for everybody who's put all of your efforts into thinking this through and trying to come up with solutions. It, it is, thank, thank you to everybody who's trying to help. Thank you, thank leave you, Captain. Leave it at that. Okay. Item B, report on housing element work plan and status of regional housing needs allocation, RENA distribution. And this is Cindy. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide an update on the RENA determination for the 2023 to 2031 planning cycle and to request direction on whether to appeal Gilroy's allocation. We will also discuss next steps regarding an update to the city's housing element. Hold on just a moment. On May 20th, the ABAG Executive Board approved the final RENA methodology and draft housing un unit allocations for the Bay Area. In comparison to the current 2015 to 2023 planning period, Gilroy's draft allocation for 2023 to 2031 is 1,773 housing units. This includes 
669 very low income units, 385 low income units, 200 moderate income units, and 519 above moderate market rate units. Notably, while the overall number of units has increased, as it has for all cities across the state, Gilroy received a higher percentage of very low and low income units under an equity adjustment factor. Pursuant to state law, the city may file an appeal to modify Gilroy's allocation. As summarized here, there are three state defined reasons upon which the city may base its appeal. However, appeals are historically unsuccessful and the city's total arena is in proportion to its share of the region's total households. Therefore, staff is recommending that the city council not appeal Gilroy's RENA determination. However, if the council wants to appeal, the deadline is 5 p.m. on July 9th of this year. Next, I want to talk about the housing element. The housing element is part of Gilroy's general plan and identifies policies and programs to meet the city's housing needs. The housing element will include a housing needs assessment, a constraints analysis, an evaluation of how we met our 2015 to 23, 2023 housing element goals, a new housing sites inventory, new policies and programs, and an extensive community outreach and engagement process. Due to the new requirements in state law, the 2023 to 2031 housing element update process is expected to be more time consuming and costly than previous cycles. California law requires that housing elements include an assessment of fair housing, which will factor into the site's inventory and the city's housing element goals, policies, and programs. If the city cannot identify adequate sites in accordance with the state's rigorous requirements, the city will need to rezone sites accordingly. The timeline at the bottom of the screen illustrates a rough estimate of the housing element update milestones. The 2023 to 2031 housing element must be certified by HCD no later than January 2023. The update process will include multiple community outreach meetings and at least two public hearings, each with the Planning Commission and the City Council. The tentative schedule also includes a study session with the City Council in September to receive directions on drafting an affordable housing ordinance and what form that might take. Staff welcomes any direction the council would like to provide as we begin the housing element update process. Staff is also requesting direction on whether to appeal ABAG's RENA distribution for the city of Gilroy. This concludes my report. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Cindy. All right, council, any, any questions of Cindy? Okay, I do not see any hands. I'm going to go to public comment then. Do we have any speakers on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. Okay, back to council. Um, this is a receive report and provide direction. Does anyone have any, 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 comments before we, I mean, uh, some, somebody wish to appeal. I do not suggest we appeal. I've been listening to that at Cities Association and I don't think it would do much good, but okay. Well then um, there's no motion necessary. It's just receive report and we're, we're good to go on. Cindy, do you have what you need? Oh, council member Bracco, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if after the report's done, can we get that first slide sent to us? Showing so our numbers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Great. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank moving you. on to item C. Declaration of certain substandard housing conditions at 402 Madison Court and 6860 Rosanna Street as blighted property and a public nuisance. Ippolito, you are back. I am. Yes. Good evening, Madam Mayor. I hope everybody could see my screen. Yes, um, we can see it. Good evening, Madam Mayor and honorable council members. My name is Hippolyte Olmos. I'm the chief building official for the city of Gilroy. I'm here tonight in the matter of declaring certain substandard housing conditions 
at 402 Madison Court and 6860 Rosanna Street as blighted property and a public nuisance. Before we start with the specifics of the subject sites, I want to provide a summary of the steps necessary to abate blighted properties within our city. Your Municipal Code Chapter 5B and 5C provide the process to abate blighted property. First, the city, first city staff must provide sufficient noticing and due process to the responsible parties to correct the violations within the timeframes pres prescribed. If the violations are not corrected, through noticing, staff can bring counsel these unresolved cases and city council can declare such properties a public nuisance. If the resolution to declare a property as blighted is passed, the notice of resolution passage is sent, to cer sent by certified mail and posted on the property. Staff will then schedule a public hearing so council can consider hearing any objections. After, hearings are, after hearing all objections, council may adopt a resolution ordering the city administrator to abate the issue. During this period, the responsible party can still choose to abate such nuisances within 30 days. If the nuisances are not abated, the city administrator may move forward with the abatement. The city administrator would then come back to city council and report the abatement cost to council. And the city's cost of abatement may be recorded and collected as a special assessment lien. So in, we have 402 Madison Court. So in 2016, the home at 402 Madison Court suffered a structure fire. A contractor then demolished and removed the majority of a fire damaged structure without building permits. In July of 2017, code enforcement opened a case after receiving complaints regarding a stalled construction project. Soon after the case was started, it was determined that the city of Gilroy has a 40 year affordable deed restriction recorded on this property. Code enforcement tried working with the property owners who seemed cooperative and at times started and then stopped. But in the end, the violations were not abated. Because these owners have failed to address the concerns or comply with notices issued, the city had a chain link fence installed along the front and the side of the property in February of 2019, which reduced the urgency of the enforcement case, but the site has remained in this condition. Over time, the remaining walls have become unstable, others have collapsed, and in our opinion, it's an attractive nuisance. The remaining studs and beams have been exposed to the elements and are damaged and unusable. So quickly, a case summary for 402 Madison. The house caught fire in September of 2016. The property is subject to a 40 year affordable resale restriction. The fire damaged structure was substantially demolished without building permits. A building permit was applied for, fees were not paid, and the application has expired. Um, after receiving complaints, code enforcement opened the case in 2017. A code enforcement has worked with the property owners, but abatement was not achieved. A violation was issued in July of 20, uh, July 25th of 2018, and due to the abandoned construction project, uh, the notice was also required. A notice was also <coughs> that fencing was required, which did not take place. Um, also, in September of 2018, a notice of pending action was served on the property owners. Um, a notice of violation was also recorded in November of 2018 against the property. In February of 2019. The city installed a fence around this property. Again, owner has taken no action to correct these violations. In total, we have uh, over 80 documented activity records trying to achieve compliance on this property. Next, we have 6860 Rosanna Street. On December 18th of 2019, code enforcement posted 6860 Rosanna do not occupy. After we had been called out to the site by our fire department, it was during this time period that code enforcement was able to verify the substandard housing conditions. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, a code enforcement division was informed that the owner uh, had passed away and that there was no known surviving heirs. The photo you see was taken after code enforcement actions requiring the property to be secured had taken place. A service company boarded up, the, uh, up this property. Uh, currently, this housing unit is uninhabitable due to the deterioration on the exterior and the interior of the structure. This photo was taken prior to the site maintenance taking place. Now, as you could see, the roof and weatherproofing has failed and the sheets of plywood were installed on the garage door to prevent entry. Code enforcement officers have posted notices on the front door and the garage door because it's considered legal service 
and there is no other mailing address known to us. This photo is um, taken from inside the house looking towards the rear of the property. You can see that the south area of this patio has already collapsed and the remaining areas are structurally deficient. Uh, this photo is of the interior and it shows the typical conditions and ceiling failures found throughout the house. A quick summary of, of this property at 6860 Rosanna Street. Uh, code enforcement officers posted the vacant structure did not occupy on December 18th, 2019 due to substandard conditions. On January 20th, the city was informed that the property owner had passed away with no known relatives. On April 8th, 2021, a notice violation was posted on the property, no response. On April 26th, code enforcement requested and obtained a title report but we were still unable to locate ownership or responsible party. Uh, April 30th, a notice of pending action was posted on the property. Again, no response. A notice of building or housing code violation was also recorded on the property on May 28th. And then uh, code enforcement continues to make regular checks with the Santa Clara County's assessor's records and the tax, direct, the tax records for this property have not changed. Um, staff recommendations. We recommend that you adopt the resolutions to declare the subject sites as blighted property and direct the city administrator to begin the process to abate such nuisances. Uh, should the city council approve the recommended resolutions, staff will immediately schedule a public hearing for city council to hear and consider any and all objections to the proposed abatement of such property blight prior to authorizing the abatement to take place. Um, after hearing any objections, council may adopt a resolution ordering the city administrator to abate. And um, uh, code enforcement officer Scott Barron and I are available to answer any questions you may have. Okay, Th thank you for that. Boy, uh, HGTV's got nothing on some of those pictures. Let me tell you, geez. Okay. <laughs> council member Rocco, <laughs> you have a comment? <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute, Dion. Hippolito, on the Rosanna property? Yes, sir. What, what, would, what would that involve? Would you completely remove the structure? No, no, no. I would not recommend we remove the structure. What I would recommend is that we just bring the interior down to the studs. Um, that's what I would recommend. Uh, just because the roof itself, it just from the years of water, have uh, allowed the sheetrock and, and uh, insulation to get so wet, it just dropped down. So really this property here just really needs a little bit of abatement. I would recommend that we do take down the back patio structure. Um, and then on the interior, we would just bring the interior down to the studs just because it's been wet for such a long period of time. And then we, we allow this property because currently the exterior looks okay. We're not receiving complaints of transients entering the site. Um, we allow for the natural process of ownership to be gained either through a bank or a tax sale or any of the other things that may occur. But currently the back of the house, um, we, I think we do have to do some abatement just to prevent from, you know, if someone goes in that house and this falls and collapse, it could cause injury and make, we may not know. Um, also the interior, um, you saw some of the photos where they're actually holding up the ceiling panels. And I just think it would be prudent for us to just uh, remove some of that potential debris that will fall on, on, on somebody. Okay, also, um, I'm sure they haven't paid any taxes. Have you checked with the assessor? Yeah, we do. Um, what their schedule is? To... Yes, we, we, we check in with are the they planning, assessors. I'm sorry. Are they Jeff. planning, are they planning to uh, do a foreclosure on it? Okay, so, so that process takes quite a bit of time. Uh, before they even foreclose, you have to be in arrears for a period of time. Then it goes to a tax sale, typically at the court, at the steps at the courthouse. But I suspect that there may be a bank in place somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, because I'm not sure. We can't figure out if this house was fully paid or not. Um, so we're monitoring uh, Santa Clara County's uh, assessor's records and seeing if ownership changes at some point. I suspect that you know it may be just running its course of uh, someone declaring ownership on this property or declaring um, ownership 
right? So um, we have to monitor the site uh, for that. But again, the recommendation would be just to remove uh, the back patio area and make, we would make an assessment of the interior. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other hands, I'm gonna ask a question then. So this, this means that you, you basically spend the minimum amount necessary to abate the nuisances, in this case, what you were just saying, the back patio and whatnot, and then what, the cost of that gets added to, gets, it's a lien, it becomes a lien on the property, Correct. so that the city's paid back for that when that property does sell? Correct. Or move or gets inhabited or whatever. And the same with Madison Court? Correct. Okay, then, Council, if everyone's clear and there are no other questions, then it would be uh, time for, well, wait, did I ask for public comment on this yet? No. No, no. so public, okay, public comment. We have uh, one person raising their hand. Okay. You may speak. This is Makan Gupta again. Uh, first of all, thank you for spending a lot of time and effort looking at these two property and uh, looking at the level of hazard and concern. Uh, why couldn't these two property be auctioned off? Other than spending more money by the city from the taxpayer, why couldn't we just auction both properties off, take the money, put it into a bank, somebody comes around trying to claim it, hey, then fight it out. Thank you. I, okay. It, do you want to uh, answer that? Andy. Yeah, okay. actually, the, 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 the short answer to that is we don't own the properties. And so we can't auction them off. Eventually, if taxes are not paid, that would be the result in effect. But the, but we, we don't have the, the legal power to do that at this time. Thank you. Okay. Any other speakers or comments? Seeing none. All right, then. So back to council, if um, there's anyone who would like to make a motion, we'll need two. I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second the motion. Council member Bracco made the motion, seconded by council member Tovar to adopt a resolution of the city council of the city of Gilroy declaring 402 Madison court to be blighted property and directing the city administrator to begin the process to abate such nuisance. Uh, can I do the two together? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, yes, it would be appropriate to have both motions in the okay. same. Okay. Okay. So, and to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy declaring 6860 Rosanna Street to be blighted property and directing the City Administrator to begin the process to abate such nuisance. Okay. Roll call. Councilmember Armendariz. Yes. Councilmember Bracco. Yes. Councilmember Hilton. Aye. Councilmember Laura Munoz. Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blinkley? Yes. And that passes, they pass unanimously. All right, item D, approval of an exception to the CalPERS 180 day waiting period for work after retirement for Bonnie Snyder, retired annuitant, to serve in an extra help position in the 911 Communication Center of the police department and Leanne McPhillips will be giving this report. Good evening, mayor and members of the city council. Tonight, we're asking the council to adopt a resolution of the city council of the city of Gilroy, approving the exception to the CalPERS 180 day wait period and appointment of Bonnie Snyder, a CalPERS retired annuitant to an extra help position in the 911 communications center of the Gilroy police department. Under CalPERS law, the city uh, may not hire a CalPERS retiree until 180 days has passed from the date of their retirement. And, but an exception can be made if the governing body adopts a resolution to waive this separation period. The waiver allows the employer to hire the retired annuitant to perform work of a limited duration to include special projects and elimination of backlogged work. Government Code Section 21224 allows agencies to hire retirees to extra help positions and to perform work of limited duration to include work in excess of what permanent employees can do. Government Code Section 752256 allows the governing body to the, adopt the resolution with a 180-day exception 
certifying the nature of the employment and that the employment is necessary to fill cr a critically needed position before the 180 days has passed. That is definitely the case here in this situation. We are in need of extra help staffing in our 911 communication center. Retired annuitant Bonnie Snyder has the experience and expertise to perform the work having recently retired from this position. Ms. Snyder will work no more than 960 hours in a fiscal year and the city will comply with all aspects of the government code related to the employment of retired annuitants. Uh, the salary savings from the current vacant positions will cover the cost of the extra help work, so there is no fiscal impact associated with this assignment. Um, at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have. All right, thank you. Council, any questions of Leanne? Council Member Armendaris? Hi, thank you. Um, Leanne, how often uh, have we had to do this in the past with this or other positions? One time in the past. I've brought this resolution to council. In the past, like um, five years, 10 years? In the past, uh, well, I've only brought this resolution one other time and it was during yeah. COVID when we brought Joe Hall back to be a extra help accountant in the finance department. Okay, thank you. I'm just- That's something we do with regular frequency. Okay, that's my concern. Thank you, Leanne. Any other questions? Okay, then I'll go to public comment. Do we have anybody from the public wanting to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine at this time or unmute yourself. Or raise your hand, sorry. <laughs> Seeing none. All right, thank you. So no more public comment. Um, I'm ready for a motion if nobody has anything else to, to add to this. Would anyone like to make a motion? Move approval. Okay. Second. Okay, Council Member Laromanios made the motion. Council Member Bracco seconded to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy approving the exception to the CalPERS 180 day wait period and appointment of Bonnie Snyder, retired annuitant, to an extra help position in the 911 Communication Center of the Gilroy Police Department. Roll call vote. Council Member Armendariz? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Leroy Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes, that passes unanimously. All right, item E, discontinuance of certain concessions previously agreed to with the Gilroy Firefighters, IAFF Local 2805 Labor Group. And Leanne is gonna give this report as well. Yes. Um, tonight, we are asking the City Council to approve and authorize the City Administrator to execute an amendment to the Memorandum of Understanding with the Gilroy Firefighters Local 2805 to end certain agreed upon concessions effective July 1, 2021. As you all probably know, since July of 2020, uh, the Local 2805 employees have realized certain concessions in their labor contract. The concessions were implemented to achieve the payroll savings we needed to balance the city's budget as a result of the COVID-19 recession and to avoid further layoffs. As a result of the funding that we received from the American Rescue Plan Act, a review of the concessions previously agreed to by all of the employees to include Local 2805 was completed. Um, 2805 agreed to concessions um, that went beyond a scheduled salary increase to avoid any staffing reductions in the fire departments. While revenue has not yet uh, increased to allow us to restore the salary increase, some smaller concessions contained in the MOU um, can now end one year earlier than planned. Uh, the following concessions were agreed to continue through June 30th of 2022, but are now recommended to be reinstated as of July 1st, 2021. These include performance-based merit increases for those employees who are not at top step. The employees can move to their next step increase on their scheduled evaluation date in fiscal year 22. Uniform allowance of $91.67 per employee per month. Uh, their annual physical exams will include all elements, both those mandatory and non-mandatory. The fitness incentive benefit of $750 biannually for, per employee and tuition reimbursement of up to $1,000 annually per employee. 
The fiscal year 22 general fund cost to reinstate the above reference concessions is estimated to be about $175,500. Staff recommends that the council approve ending these uh, specific concessions effective July 1, 2021 and authorize the city administrator to execute the attached side letter with IAFF Local 2805. Happy to answer any questions any of you may have. Thank you, Leanne. Council, any questions of Leanne? Okay, seeing none, um, public comment. Christina, do we have anybody in the house? If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand at this time or uh, press star nine to unmute yourself. Amen. All right, thank you. So back to council. Would someone like to make a motion? Council I'll Member Tovar? Motion. I'll make the motion. Council, council Member Bracco with a second. Okay, to approve and authorize the city administrator to execute an amendment to the memorandum of understanding with Gilroy Firefighters, IAFF Local 2805, which ends certain agreed upon concessions effective July 1, 2021. Roll call vote. Council Member Armendariz? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes, and that passes unanimously. Thank you, Council. Okay. Thank you, Leanne. All right, City Administrator's reports. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have two quick items for you. Uh, first, the city's messaging for the July 4th, July 4th fireworks show will begin tomorrow. I do want to let the public know that we are not having a public gathering again this year, but we are, uh, of course, uh, uh, performing a show with uh, street closures around the area. So we do encourage people not to come down to Gilroy High to watch from their driveway or somewhere in the vicinity. Uh, but uh, as in last year, well, we did shoot them a little bit higher just to make sure that more people could see them. So I, I hope everybody enjoys that uh, little sense of normalcy uh, we haven't had in a while. And second, I want to uh, congratulate the city and the finance department and uh, public works departments on a very successful wastewater revenue bond sale last Wednesday. Uh, this is an interest rate you're not going to believe, I tell you, 2.39%. Uh, uh, all in cost of funds for a 35 year financing bond of $47 million. Uh, the market really liked us. And so uh, that is really good news for uh, Scraw and for our plan expansion. And just to give you a little sense, we've had a 20 year bond that is going to expire next year. And then this bond takes over and the cost of the bonds are almost the same. Uh, even though we, we have a lot more money here just because of the interest rate. So uh, not a big hit to our rate payers to cover additional debt service. Uh, due to the good market. So congratulations to uh, Harjot Sangha and the whole team. Uh, that's the, the good news to, to send to council. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think he's got me signing signing a bunch of stuff tomorrow, right? Related to this. Yay, it's going to be fun. Okay, city attorney's report. I have no report. Wow. Okay, then um, Andy, you want to get us into closed session? I never remember sure. how to yeah, no, that, that's fine. So we we have one closed session. It's public employee appointment slash employment pursuant to government code section 54957 and Gilroy City Code section 17A112, name, title, city clerk. So what we need to do now is clear the room. And then when we go into closed session, we need to take a vote to remain in closed session. Okay, when do I take public comment on closed session? Right now. All right, Christina, is there anyone from the public who would like to uh, speak on this? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right then, no more public comment. So we're clearing the room. All right, so now we should adjourn to closed session. That's correct. Okay. Let's adjourn to closed session. In the Facebook Live. Okay.